Japanese yuppie pop, more commonly known as city pop, has seen success and amassed a decent fan base in recent years. This has brought on a second wind of popularity for artists like Anli, Maria Takeuchi, and Tomoko Aran. There are some artists from this magical bubble era that had potential to contribute to this unique and nostalgic genre, though simply never saw a professional release, if any release at all. This was, unfortunately, the case for Yasuko Endo, a model and actress set to debut her very first single. This single never saw a release, however, due to her untimely death at only 17 years old. This single, officially titled In the Distance, being an elusive piece of lost media, possibly even the holy grail of city pop lost media. Let's rewind though. Yasuko Endo, known by her friends and family as simply Yako, was born on October 21st of 1968. She had begun working in the entertainment industry as early as the fifth grade when she belonged to a children's theater company. She briefly attended high school but made the decision to drop out and pursue a modeling career. Endo saw success as a model and was later cast in various acting roles. During her career, Endo had modeled for magazines such as Hanato Yume, Olive, and MC Sister. She had appeared in commercials for Kentucky and Sapporo Ichiban, among many others. Endo did see somewhat of a large role in 1985 when casted in a couple episodes of the massively popular Skeban Deka drama, at the time starring idol Yuki Saito. Endo played Ayumi Mizuchi, a villain featured in the first story arc of the manga. She's also in the 1991 OVA. Mizuchi is a renowned gang leader who is involved in drug deals, extortion of students, and was the daughter of a prominent politician. Skebandeka as a show and manga anime is wild. I highly recommend checking it out, and Endo herself did a great job in this role. Endo started working as a model in 1983, and the Skeban role was in 1985. It was in early 1986, however, when Endo had planned to broaden her horizons and debut as a bona fide idol. At 17 years old, this was a bit later than the debut of most idols. Due to this, her image was a bit more mature and not the typical cutesy Seiko Matsuda type, if that makes sense. Endo was born and raised in Tokyo, and her family lived within the city as well. This served as a great benefit to Endo as her mother had a friend who owned a jazz club in Asakusa. This club served as the setting for her to debut her song In the Distance as well as cover an Akina Nakamori song. This debut occurred only six days before her passing. Endo had recorded this single with the now defunct Rivstar Records, a label that eventually went under in the early 1990s due to some rather shady dealings with organized crime organizations. The single, titled In the Distance, contained two songs, the titular In the Distance and another track titled Telephone. The songs were composed by a man named Tetsuo Sakurai, most famous for his work as bassist in the group Cassiopeia. Endo's voice was described as mature and husky, and her music was speculated to be ballads in a minor key and similar in style to Yuki Saito's Shiroi Hono, this song being the end theme to Sukeban Deka at the time. According to Endo's mother, as well as various magazine reviews at the time, the single was officially completed in February of 1986. This was when the master and some known copies were produced. Known receivers being the magazines and radio stations that reviewed the single, as well as Endo herself, who remarked that she herself was impressed at how great the songs turned out. According to those who knew her, Yasuko Endo apparently had little faith in her singing abilities and was surprised that it actually sounded good. In the Distance was set to have an official national release in May. Promotional material, as well as the singles themselves, were being produced in anticipation of this. It was on March 29th of 1986 when production was cut short. This was the day that Endo had unfortunately passed away. This news was unexpected and sudden. Just weeks later, on April 8th of 1986, the famous idol Yukiko Okada passed away as well. 
Due to all the negative press from this unfortunate news, Rivstar Records had made the decision to ultimately destroy any and all copies of In the Distance and canceled its release. For that reason, In the Distance was never heard and appreciated by the public. It was never released. The songs Endel herself was proud of were destroyed and life went on without any knowledge of In the Distance and the music within it. The specific song, In the Distance, did live on in other forms, however. The most prominent being Tetsuo Sakurai's own cover in April of 1986 on his album Dewdrops. Because this track came out only one month following Endo's passing, it's unknown if Sakurai's cover was planned in addition to Endo's own single. You can check out this song for yourself, Sakurai's cover is not lost. However, the song lyrics are altered to be from a male perspective instead, so the original by Endo would be different. In addition, Endo's good friend, idol Miho Nakayama, was especially saddened by Endo's passing. Having often modeled together, the two had been good friends since Nakayama was only 12 years old. Miho Nakayama communicated her feelings of grief in her 1988 song, Long Distance to the Heaven, which she wrote and composed herself. This song is not the lost single itself, only meant as a way of remembering Endo. Years went by and the song was thought to be long gone. With no singles surfacing and with Rivstar Records going under in 1993 due to later becoming a front for money laundering. That's right. Rivstar Records, which was once a legitimate record label, eventually became a dummy company for laundering money, likely for the Yakuza. Yes, I'm serious. This was a huge scandal at the time, and Rivstar dissolved shortly after this came to light as they had filed for bankruptcy. It was commonly thought that In the Distance was lost with the company that owned the rights to it. It's completely unknown who even holds the rights to Yasuko Endo's lost single today. What the cover of the single itself looked like wasn't even known. Nothing about this single was known aside from the title. But what if the single wasn't lost? What if one of those review copies had survived almost four decades later and could at long last be heard? Well, suspicions of a surviving single were confirmed. This was when a Yahoo Auctions listing surfaced in August of 2022. 36 years later, the listing did sell. It sold for only 11,500 yen, which is about 110 US dollars. I, despite being really passionate about this piece of lost media since 2019-ish, did not catch wind of this and I was unable to place a bid. I hadn't been informed that this listing even existed until months later, unfortunately. Though, if I had, I assure you, the single would be in my possession and shared with the world. Not all hope is lost, though. The images from the listing tell quite the story. For starters, we now know what the cover looked like. We also see part of the lyrics to Telephone, as well as some information on Yasuko herself. The information provided includes acting credits, which may suggest that this was a review copy sent to a media outlet. Kind of like a cheat sheet to explain who Yasuko Endo is in a magazine review or a radio segment, perhaps? The coolest element of this discovery, however, being the official catalog number. A number that checks out when comparing it to Rivstar's other releases of the time. Because of this Yahoo Auctions listing surfacing, In the Distance's information is now documented and preserved on Discogs. The music itself, however, remains completely lost. Again, hope is not lost. If anything, it's revived with the knowledge that at least one copy has survived. This means that more copies could be out there and that the single may someday be recovered and preserved. If that does happen, you'll definitely hear about it from me. Let's be honest here. If you choose to live a life in the public eye, especially as an entertainer, there's going to be people who try to dig up information on you. All those Wikipedia articles that detail a celebrity's life story down to the vital statistics don't just materialize from thin air. 
This information is often shared actively by the celebrity, but sometimes excavated by devoted fans or the media. And that, specifically, is what makes this musician in today's video so special and interesting. Upon looking at their Wikipedia article, I was surprised to find the words undisclosed under where the birth name typically lies. Even their own face on album covers and in live performances was intentionally undisclosed. Always obscured with glasses and long curly hair. It's not even known if their hair was real or a wig, that's how little we know about the actual person. Their clothes were also very loose and masculine, as though they did not want to be identified at all. Identified by nothing other than their musical talent, that is. That and the stage name they chose for themselves. The name they allowed Japan to refer to them as, Doji Morita. And really, that's all that was needed. Morita's music speaks for itself. The music presented made a statement. It was grim and macabre. Speaking to topics typically unsaid in the Japan they performed for. These topics felt real and concrete, as though Morita had truly been through tragedy and hardship in their life. Though, the details of Morita's life was just as unknown as their face. How did keeping such a private life benefit them? Were there any repercussions? And did any personal details get revealed in the 50 plus years following their debut? Well, let's explore that. Today, we're talking about the life of Doji Morita, Japan's darkest musician. The birthplace of Morita has been the source of speculation for many years. Even that isn't truly known. According to dedicated fans, the birthplace of Morita is one of two places. Within the city of Tokyo, or somewhere within Aomori Prefecture in the year 1952. The Aomori theory supposedly comes from promotional material passed out at a 1980 concert. This promotional material being a pamphlet given out during the concert that shared tidbits about Morita as a person. This was one of the very few documents that actually did. Beyond time and place of birth, there are some other aspects of Morita's life that are a bit more concrete. Those being the documented drive behind becoming a musician. Simmer down to two events in their life. Their involvement in school protests in the late 1960s and the later death of a close friend in the early 1970s. And in order to better understand this time period, it's time for a brief Japanese history lesson. The late 1960s school protests that Morita referenced involvement in were likely the Japanese university protests of 1968 and 1969. These protests, often escalating and becoming riots, were a massive event in post-war Japan. At its peak, 41% of students had refused to attend class and were instead joining in actions of protest and activism, forming organized protest groups referred to as Zen Kyoto. But what were they protesting exactly? An overabundance of grievances, actually, ranging from personal to political. Really, the issue protested often varied greatly from school to school as each university had their own issues they were protesting. The biggest topics of outrage included dismay at the cost of tuition, internships that failed to pay students for their hard work, equality to female students, and a general disagreement with the Vietnam War and the actions being taken regarding it at the time. The student's method of protest was often forceful and often escalated to acts of violence. There was a lot of outrage that fueled this time in Japanese history, and all the reasons behind said upset had been piling on for decades. These university protests eventually got so bad that they required government intervention. Multiple universities were literally seized by their own student body. And due to said government intervention, these protests eventually stopped and were completely ceased by the year 1970. Different groups did come about in the wake of these protests, however, most notably the Women's Liberation Movement, a group that would pave the way for Japanese women's rights leading into the 1980s. And that concludes my little history lesson. It really is important to identify the time period Morita lived in so that we can better understand their music and motivation behind it. This was a time when post-war Japan was rapidly transforming. 
Following their involvement in these protests, likely when only a teenager and in high school, Morita made the decision to not continue their own educational career, reportedly dropping out in the year 1970. It's unknown what Morita did in the years following, that is, until the summer of 1972. That was when a young Morita, likely in their early 20s, had experienced the loss of their close friend. That 1980 concert pamphlet that we previously mentioned, titled A Rough Sketch of Doji Morita, once again revealed this detail. Morita was already unhappy with the struggles they faced with education, and the passing of their friend made them linger on the thought of how short-lived and fleeting youth truly is. The friend's name was never specified, no details were given beyond the fact that they had passed on. Though, this event is noted as what finally pushed Morita to enter the music scene, with a unique darkness and sense of melancholy that had yet to be seen before. It was almost three years later, in 1975, when Morita made their quiet yet sudden debut with their very first single, ironically called Goodbye, as well as the single Sayonara Boku no Tomodachi. As one may expect, the titular song on both the single and album discussed the passing of Morita's friend. That Sunday morning when my friends got caught, staggering within the rain, you've shown me kindness since then. You've changed since then. Goodbye, my friend. You, the quiet one with the beard. In the room you never came home to. Your toothbrush and your coat. Your toothbrush and your coat are still here. Goodbye, my friend. In an era of Japan quickly taken by kaiokyoku, or western-inspired popular music, Morita's unique underground image was a juxtaposition to say the least. While they did not achieve massive stardom and renown, they began collecting a dedicated following, listeners who appreciated the rawness of their music rather than a visual spectacle, marketed image, or pretty face. The professional career of Morita can be described as underground and modest. While they partook in multiple interviews, the information shared was focused on their music and vision in their art, never really delving into them as a person. The image Morita possessed remained constant throughout their career, large circular glasses obscuring their eyes, thick curly hair obscuring the remainder of their face. Their choice of dress was intentionally androgynous. They used phrasing that was not entirely masculine nor feminine. Subtle things like this added to Morita's anonymous image. 1975's Goodbye was only the beginning of their career, and if I said Doji Morita didn't have a following after entering the music industry on a professional level, well, I'd be lying. Much like how people flock to the works of Osamu Dazai for their unique take on dismal and joyless topics, the same went for the musical works of Morita. But just how dismal was the music of Doji Morita? Let's explore the rest of their discography. Only one year following their debut, Doji Morita released Mother's Sky. This album saw many unique tracks, beginning with the subtle melancholy of a song titled Our Mistake, also translated to Our Failure. Under the sunlight filtering through the leaves of spring, I was such a weakling, bathing in your kindness, wasn't I? We got tired of talking and at some point fell silent. A hot plate on top of a stove burned red. This album presents the same themes of how brief and fleeting youth really is. Monita's dismay at their bygone youth is constantly present within the album, but certain songs present short outbursts in between. As if Morita is overwhelmed by these feelings and frustrated because of it. An example of this is the song Gyaku Kosen, or Backlight. While each song in itself is not too harsh, listening to a Doji Morita album in full can leave a very bitter taste in your mouth. As though you can feel the unhappiness, hopelessness, and yearning the artists felt as they wrote and performed these songs. Morita's 1977 release, titled A Boy, continued these themes, beginning with the first track, Aoki Yorua, or Blue Night. Spring is a phantom. The two of us are lost within a sad dream. 
shall I, carrying on as we are, fall further into ruin with you? Can we go back? Can we return? Or shall I, carrying on as we are, sleep beside you a little longer? In my opinion, this album specifically captured a feeling of yearning and desperation, like a want, even possibly a need to just go back. The song Samishi Sobyo is a highlight of this album that showcases that. It's just capturing a moment where the speaker is lonely and trying to cope with their feelings. The lyrics are simple yet concrete. Pairing this with Morita's haunting vocals is an experience unlike any other. It was in 1978 that Morita performed songs for their first and only live album. This was in Tokyo at a church of all places. That church being the St. Mary's Cathedral in the Bunkyo Ward. While you may be picturing a small local church, I assure you it is not. The architecture is modern gothic. Really, as strange as it sounds out of context, this was the perfect setting for Morita's work. The insert in one of the vinyl releases shows the show itself, though I cannot find any actual footage. It's clear in these photos, however, that Morita's appearance is obscure, just like how it was on the album covers and press photos. You can't really see much of their face, if any really at all. The next original songs would come about two years later in 1980 in the album The Last Waltz. The next would come in 1982 with Nocturne, retaining the same dark themes but producing music at a slower rate. It was at this point where Morita seemed to be a little burnt out or unmotivated to create music like they did in the beginning. Though nobody knew if this was truly the case because nobody knew anything about this artist aside from what they chose to share. That being through music. This music did not falter in quality though, if anything, it continued to communicate loneliness and yearning in more unique ways. One track from The Last Waltz is a good example of this, its lyrics are disjointed. As though the speaker is slipping away. Other songs from this early 80s era share the same mood, the illicit heartache and an unpleasant seclusion, one that's almost sedating. Now, as a comparison, I'd recommend googling what's topping the Oricon charts in these years, the years that Morita was active, just to see the kind of artists that the mainstream liked. The big ones being names like Hiromi Go, Seiko Matsuda, and Candies. All of these artists are idols. Artists that sang love songs and upbeat pop. If you look up the lyrics of their songs, they're pretty tame, pretty happy, and sterile. The kind of stuff that can be applied to the majority of those listening, that being the majority of the Japanese public at the time. It was stuff people wanted to hear, not stuff that made them uncomfortable or solemn. Not saying that's a bad thing, but it was very different from Morita's music. Morita didn't do it for fame. They had a message and they wanted to be heard in their most genuine form. It was in 1983 that Doji Morita decided enough was enough and announced their retirement from music. This was directly following the release of their final album, 1983's Wolf Boy. And with that announcement of retirement, Morita performed one final live show. Seven albums in a total of only eight years, totaling in 64 original songs. Doji Morita sang about a lot of really personal things, the longing for youth, the feelings of failure, the acts of defiance they took part in with their protests and engagement with their friends. Despite the transparency, nobody ever got a look at their face or learned their real name. The listeners knowing so much about Morita without even knowing what they looked like or what kind of life they led beyond the stage. Many fans had speculated why they stopped making music. Did they become overcome by all the grief they sang about? Were they simply resolved and got all their feelings out so that they could maybe just move on and live life? Did they feel they no longer had an audience? Japan in 1983 was entering the luxurious bubble era. The Japan of this era was especially materialistic and this was only going to escalate as the decade went on. With that considered, those days of Morita's youth were truly long gone. Nobody knew where Doji Morita went following this. They vanished with no further information. If you watched part one of my video on the rise and fall of idol Noriko Sakai, you may already be briefed on the trendy drama trend of the early 90s. 
There was one trendy drama in particular that gave Morita mainstream recognition for the first time in their career. Ten years have passed, and it's the year 1993. The drama was Koko Kyoshi, or High School Teacher. It was written by Shinji Nojima, the very same man who took part in writing Noriko Sakai's best-known dramas. One being Under One Roof, which also aired in 1993. Now, unlike most trendy dramas of this time period, High School Teacher was quite a bit darker. As a matter of fact, it was initially pitched as an anti-trendy drama. The plot illustrated a battery of social taboos. This included inappropriate relations between students, teacher and student, and siblings. This drama was very controversial, but also immensely popular. During High School Teacher's initial airing, there was a great deal of buzz surrounding the finale as well as all the uncomfortable scenarios brought about within the course of the story. The finale itself is especially controversial and still debated upon today. I won't spoil it just in case anyone wants to watch this drama at some point, though. High School Teacher is not an innocent or wholesome love story. It's very unlike dramas like Tokyo Love Story, Summer Story, or Under One Roof. The story of High School Teacher is a very sad one. A sad story that was beautifully complemented by the music of Doji Morita. That's right. While Morita gathered their own dedicated fan base throughout the late 70s and early 80s, the height of their career never occurred until a full decade had passed since their retirement. This was with the use of the 1976 song Our Mistake as High School Teacher's opening. Shinji Nojima was a huge fan of Morita's work and specifically wanted their music to be used in the drama. With the success and controversy of High School Teacher, Morita's music became popular on a mainstream level. Prior to the drama's release in early 1993, the music of Morita was not easily obtainable in record stores. By this time, their records were not selling well and had gone out of print. And typically, trendy dramas often pick music by artists who were popular currently. The choice of adding Our Mistake, a song that was 17 years old and relatively unknown at that point, was an unusual one. Following the influence of Nojima's drama, Our Mistake had seen its very first time on the mainstream Oricon charts through the drama's soundtrack and was praised as a hidden masterpiece. Morita's albums themselves were being produced once again for the very first time on CD, and a Best Of album being released for the very first time as well. Despite the resurgence in attention on Morita, including a new generation of youths taken by this music, they did not appear again publicly, and they remained in retirement. The new fans, as well as the old, continued to speculate on who they really were and where they went. More so than ever. But still, no answers were found. It was another decade later, in 2003, when High School Teachers saw a modernized remake. This one also featured that same Doji Morita song as its opening. Only, it was a little different. This opening was a re-recording, sung by Doji Morita themselves 20 years after retirement. This confirmed that Morita was alive and well in 2003. While they still did not make another public appearance, the last still being that final 1983 show, they came out of retirement to create one last recording. This once again caused a surge in attention on Morita, now with even more dedicated efforts to figure out who the person behind the glasses and thick hair really was. The internet was actively used by the average consumer by this point, and the intrigue was primarily hosted on Tuchan at this time. Fans were now able to dig up and share old magazine interviews and photos. Still, they never were able to track Morita themselves down and find any answers. Years went on and the mystery was never solved. Morita retained their privacy. That is, until the year 2021. Rei Nakanishi was a famous songwriter and musician, very well known for writing an abundance of Japanese pop music over the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and winning many awards for their work in the music industry. Though, in the 1990s, he decided to step away from music and begin writing essays and novels. Their final book was a biographical work that they requested to be released after their passing, found as a manuscript in their office. A 2021 book titled Chi no Uta, or Blood Song. Now, what in the world does this have to do with Doji Morita? 
a great deal more than you may think. You see, according to this book, Doji Morita was Nakanishi's niece. This was something that was speculated upon a lot on internet boards, actually. Up until 2020 on Morita-related threads on 5chan, people on these boards had found public records, addresses, and death announcements that correlated to these theories. But nothing concrete ever came about to prove the theory once and for all. It was with this book that the hardship and strife of Morita's life was revealed. At least a piece of it. What was also revealed was their name, or rather, her name. Minobu Nakanishi. While Morita was ambiguous in their musical career and image, their voice was distinctly feminine. This wasn't a huge revelation, but a confirmation nonetheless. Morita's father was Rei Nakanishi's brother, a former pilot during the Second World War named Shoichi Nakanishi. Following the war, Shoichi had a great deal of PTSD as he survived various attacks. He had also founded multiple companies and a golf course at the war's end by loaning money from his brother Rei, but unfortunately managed them poorly and drove his family into poverty, resulting in a difficult upbringing for Morita. With nowhere else to go at one point, they reportedly moved in with Rei Nakanishi. Some kind of conflict between Lei and his brother ultimately led him to kicking the entire family out. Morita may have held disdain towards her father. This clash between generations was definitely seen during the university protests that Morita was engaged in in the late 60s. Rei Nakanishi claimed that Morita began singing in the underground scene in 1973. They were regular performers at live houses before receiving a record label offer. It was decided that Morita would hide her real name and connection to her famous uncle in order to maintain a holistic image that wasn't commercialized. Nakanishi's book also stated that Morita greatly feared having the negative connection of her father's business failures discovered as well. She feared receiving negative press for that reason. So, at its core, Morita really did want to only be known for her music. She wanted to make a name for herself organically and do things the way she wanted. What about her retirement, though? Did Morita quit making music because it was too much? Was she unable to continue her pursuits in a materialistic 80s Japan? The real reason is neither. Doji, or rather Minobu, wanted to marry and become a housewife. Turns out, during her private life, Morita had fallen for her manager a man named Ado Maeda, who actually was a friend of Rei Nakanishi. In 1983, Morita and Maeda decided to marry. Morita no longer wished to sing about her bygone past and the sorrows she endured. She decided to retire because she had a future to look forward to and a new life to live. Turns out, Doji Morita just wanted to settle down and become a housewife. And that's exactly what Minobu Maeda did. The two remained married in the decades that followed, buying a home in 1983. A home that 5chan users had their eye on prior to the release of Chi no Uta. Unfortunately, the reason this home came to the attention of internet users was the passing of Ado Maeda in 2010. Then, later on, the passing of Aminobu Maeda in 2018. Unfortunately, Doji Morita had passed away in 2018 at age 66. Nakanishi's book discussed this. Apparently, Morita was heartbroken when her husband had passed away eight years prior. She was incredibly lonely and remained in the home they purchased together back in 1983. It was in 2018 when she passed away from heart failure. They Nakanishi personally felt that she died from a broken heart. A couple years later, that same home was demolished. A new one now stands in its place. So, at long last, the mystery behind who Doji Morita was had been revealed. Somewhat. This revelation intentionally came about following the passing of Nakanishi, Maeda, and Morita. For that reason, Morita herself cannot come forward to clarify or confirm any details given within the book. We really don't know how much of it is actually true. The Japanese public never saw what Doji Morita looked like past their public disguise. 
Morita likely walked the streets of Tokyo on a regular basis without anyone having the slightest idea of who they were and what they contributed to Japanese music. Though, I think that's exactly how Doji Morita wanted it. Yutako Ozaki may be among the most influential musicians in Japan's recent history. A gifted young songwriter who rose to popularity during a time when the upstanding yet aggressively manufactured idol dominated the entire entertainment industry. Even today, Ozaki is beloved and respected, ranking 23rd on a poll of Japan's top 100 musicians of all time. His songs have been covered by an abundance of other prominent artists over the years, from Japan and beyond. Debuting at only 17 years old, Ozaki was raw and distinct, an artist who spoke to nostalgia, heartache, and rebellion. An artist who left as quickly as he had appeared, only active for a total of nine years between 1983 and 1992. His impressive musical career cut short over the span of one single night in the spring of 1992, a night shrouded with mystery and copious speculation. This is the tragedy of Yutaka Ozaki, a 30-year mystery. Yutaka Ozaki was born in Setagaya, a ward within Tokyo, on November 29th of 1965. He had one older brother named Yasushi. Ozaki was riddled with health issues as a small child and was quite sickly, once being hospitalized for severe bronchitis before once again requiring hospitalization for intestinal torsion, a condition that results from intestines becoming unnaturally twisted and tangled. Ozaki did begin learning martial arts as a small child at only five or six, though this hobby did not last. Instead, he was taken by the piano and began learning it in 1975 at 10 years old. Ozaki also began learning guitar when his older brother brought one home one day and just lost interest in it, thus being inherited by Ozaki. That same year, in 1975, he wrote his very first poem, a poem that would kickstart his passion in songwriting. At this age, Ozaki dedicated the entirety of his time to music and had a distinct lack of interest in school. He would often leave home pretending to go to class before returning home an hour later to write and play music. There was supposedly even a six-month period where he did not attend a single class. This changed when Ozaki chose to go to a school within the Nerima ward of Tokyo. In 1978, Ozaki performed his first original song at his middle school's culture festival. Referred to in Japan as Bunkasai, culture festivals are a huge event in Japanese schools and are open to the public. Anyone from family to students wanting to attend the school in the future will attend and they showcase the talents and artistic achievements of their students. With that said, a culture festival was an opportune place for Ozaki to present his talent. Yutaka Ozaki's musical talent continued to expand beyond this point. It was in high school when he began playing at live houses throughout Tokyo as an amateur performer. Ozaki's early music at this time had heavy folk influence, though he would later find influence in Western artists like Bruce Springsteen, Jackson Brown, and Billy Joel. As Ozaki's focus on music rose, his interest in school waned once more. Ozaki became somewhat of a delinquent and was in trouble on a regular basis. This included smoking, getting drunk in Shibuya, and being involved in fights. He was even in a motorcycle accident at one point that left him suspended. Ozaki was kind of the textbook example of an 80s high school delinquent, and his various misadventures fueled the setting and mood of his music. And mind you, this wasn't unusual, as delinquency and petty crime was at an all-time high in 80s Japan. High school delinquents were pretty common. Ozaki was a hard worker though, regardless of what he enjoyed in his free time, having worked as both a paperboy and waiter during this time. That all changed when Ozaki was discovered by a producer named Akira Shudo while playing one night when he was only 17 years old. This was in his sophomore year of high school. Upon being discovered by Shudo, Ozaki dropped out of high school and decided to pursue a career in music. Ozaki was quickly signed to CBS Sony and released his first album, Junanasai no Chizu, or 17's Map. 
Many tracks were based on his experience as a, well, 17-year-old, including Soltsugyol or Graduation, one of his best-known songs. The themes of rebellion and lack of faith in society featured in Junanasai no Chizu were met with controversy as well as a movement among young people at the time. Ozaki released his third album, Kowareta Tobirakara, or Through the Broken Door, in 1985 at only 19 years old. With even more music that expressed the longing for love, the yearning to see our dreams come true, and the angst associated with navigating society and life. Following a somewhat long bout of writer's block and a break from music in America, Ozaki released his fourth album three years later in 1988. It was around this time that he married a woman named Shigemi, a woman who worked a normal 9-to-5 job and was not in the entertainment industry. This news caused quite a bit of a stir at the time for that reason. By 1990, reaching his mid-twenties, Ozaki's priorities and motivation began to shift. Who was once a rebellious teen was now a husband and new father. In 1989, Shigemi gave birth to Ozaki's son, Hiroya Ozaki. His fifth studio album was titled Tanjo, or Birth, and lacked the angst Ozaki was associated with up until that point. Also, as a side note, this album was released by Moon Records, a label owned by Tatsuro Yamashita and Maria Takeuchi, respectively the king and queen of city pop. One final album would be released in May of 1992, one that was praised for returning to Ozaki's defiant roots. Unfortunately, the release of this album would be posthumous. This brings us to a month prior, in April of 1992. It was in the early morning of April 25th that a person was walking through a residential area of Senju Kawaramachi in Adachi, Tokyo. This person was the wife of a landlord within the area. She was walking through the front garden of one of her properties when she was alerted to a troubling sight. A man wearing no clothing, lying on the ground. The most disturbing element of all of this was the man was covered in bruises and scuffs, as if he was beaten up. The woman, fearing the worst, approached this man. He was conscious, but only barely, as he was very drunk. Onlookers recalled the man slurring and rambling incoherently, at one point spilling the contents of their bag on the ground. The woman promptly rushed to call an ambulance. At this time, she had no idea the man she had just helped was Yutaka Ozaki. He would have been hard to recognize. At 5 a.m. that very same morning, Ozaki was admitted to a hospital in the nearby Sumida ward. It was at this point that Ozaki was more coherent and explained that he was trying to get to his home, later revealed to only be 500 meters away from where he was found, and that all he wanted was to just go home. Ozaki felt he didn't need treatment, that he was fine and just wanted to sleep it off. Ozaki's doctor disagreed, however, and felt that Ozaki should definitely stay, that a specialist should look at Ozaki and ensure there weren't any underlying issues that needed to be addressed. Ozaki vehemently disagreed and continued to demand that he be discharged, despite still being drunk and in very poor shape. Eventually, upon becoming even more forceful and adamant, the hospital staff was left with no choice. After ensuring his pulse and body temperature readings were normal, they contacted Ozaki's wife Shigemi to come pick him up. She arrived with Yasushi, Ozaki's brother, and the two took Ozaki home. Upon arriving, Shigemi recalls Ozaki laying down to rest and sleeping soundly. Ozaki's family remained near him, confirming he was in a deep sleep and taking steady breaths. Hours later, at around 11 a.m., Shigemi noticed that Ozaki had stopped breathing. She immediately called an ambulance. Ozaki was rushed to another hospital and the staff had discovered Ozaki was experiencing cardiopulmonary arrest. They quickly attempted to treat and resuscitate him. None of these attempts were successful. Yutaka Ozaki passed away at 12.06 p.m. at age 26. Cause of death was officially declared as pulmonary edema, or an accumulation of fluids within the lungs.
Ozaki's death was looked into at great lengths following this, and the autopsy claimed that there was no foul play. The public, upon hearing of the shape Ozaki was found in, did not agree with this. These feelings were only magnified when photos of Ozaki in the hospital had surfaced and people saw the shape he was in. A petition was started with the help of Ozaki's father. Over 100,000 signatures were received in hopes that Ozaki's cause of death would be re-evaluated. Despite the public outcry, this official ruling remained and was never revised. What was found in the toxicology report was cited as the conclusion in this decision by officials. It was declared that methamphetamine had been found in Ozaki's system as well as alcohol. With the release of this information, it was simply expected that the dots would connect and what happened to Ozaki would be universally understood and resolved. That being under the influence like this caused Ozaki to lack coordination and end up in the rough shape he was in simply because he was so out of it. The public outcry remained and people still did not agree with the official findings. So, the occurrences of that April night are basically narrowed down to two commonly suggested scenarios. One, that Ozaki got drunk, high, and at some point in a bar fight. Ozaki was no stranger to scandal. During the 1980s, he was caught with stimulants multiple times. He also was known to have quite a few skirmishes in his high school days. His rebellious image was very well known and that was not surprising. The other common theory, however, is that Ozaki was murdered. Some even feel Ozaki's drink may have been laced at some point during his time out drinking, and that that would explain why he was so out of it and unable to speak or walk when he was found in that garden. As far as who would want to do this to Ozaki, who knows? There's been plenty of theories, but nothing substantial. Following this ordeal, Shigemi and Hiroya left Japan and moved to Boston, Massachusetts in the United States. Wishing to live life and raise her son away from all the press and reminders of her husband's tragic passing, Hiroya is now all grown up and now a musical artist himself. He's very talented and his music is pretty good. I definitely recommend it. I personally think his father would be nothing short of proud of his son and how much he has accomplished. Today, Ozaki remains a beloved musical artist. His 1983 song, I Love You, as well as his 1992 release, Oh My Little Girl, have been covered by Japan's most talented artists. This includes Hikaru Utara, Akira Nakamori, Ryuichi Kawamura, and the band Kobukuro. There's a famous plaque located on the bridge near Shibuya Cross Tower in Tokyo that is dedicated to Ozaki's memory. This is an iconic location referenced in songs that Ozaki visited frequently in his teens. Many fans visit here to pay their respects, and if anyone is ever in the area, I very much encourage visiting it and paying your respects as well. While the man behind the music is no longer with us, his music still plays throughout Japan and is greatly cherished and loved. That much remains clear. Japanese popular music can be defined by two eras, before X and after X. What may initially appear to you as the Japanese equivalent to Guns N' Roses with just as much drama, believe me, there's so much more than that. Describing X, later dubbed X Japan, as merely that would honestly be an insult. Their history and importance to Japanese music as a whole is immeasurable. X came about in the early 80s in a time when Japanese mainstream artists didn't typically look like this. Just compare their attire with the more subdued dress of the audiences at their shows, especially during their early shows. X definitely stood out and perhaps at that time Japanese pop culture needed them. 
TLDR, X-Japan is immensely influential, just as much as they are controversial. Over the now 40 years, as of 2022, that the band has been active, they have seen a plethora of scandal, tragedy, and controversy. They are as controversial as they are influential. Today, we're going to explore this legendary Japanese band, and we're also going to look at their many controversies head-on. However, before we can understand X-Japan, we must first understand the genre and visual aesthetic that they essentially pioneered. That being Visual K. It can be said that Visual K has roots in the glam rock movement of the 1970s, as this style came about in Japan during the early 1980s. The signature attributes of Visual K include elaborate, almost exaggerated makeup, hairstyles, and wardrobe. Some will aim for a more androgynous and fluid appearance as well. While Visual K is technically a fashion movement, the look is almost exclusively associated with rock and metal bands, typically ones with heavy western hairband influence. You know, Def Leppard, Motley Crue, Skid Row, Guns N' Roses of course, that kind of thing. X comes into play here as they were a band officially founded in 1982 when Visual K was just beginning to emerge and are listed among the pioneers of this aesthetic as I mentioned previously. Going into the 1990s and even early 2000s, the trend remained though saw a significant decline. Popular bands associated with this look like Glay, Liark and Seal and even X Japan began to detach from this image somewhat. This movement saw a bit of a resurgence in the mid-2000s that extends to today. This modern equivalent is known as neo visual -ke. X has gone through quite a few members over the years, though the two founding members still remain and have known each other much longer than you'd assume. These founding members being Yoshiki Hayashi and Toshimitsu Deyama. Though, everyone refers to them as their stage names, these being Yoshiki and Toshi. Yoshiki serves as the drummer and sometimes pianist, while Toshi is the lead vocalist. The two are from Tateyama, a city within Chiba Prefecture, and met in kindergarten. Yoshiki and Toshi also attended the same elementary, middle, and high school and had an active interest in music from a young age. Yoshiki specifically, who was a child who suffered from chronic health issues and pursued classical music rather than sports. When Yoshiki was very young, he lost his father, who took his own life. After this, Yoshiki apparently became aggressive and would act out often, breaking objects in the process. Yoshiki's mother decided to buy him a drum set and asked that he take out his frustrations on that. This proved to be more than beneficial as Yoshiki and Toshi would form their very first band in 1977 at only age 11. The band was initially called Dynamite, though later they changed the name to Noise. In 1982, while still only teenagers, the two formed X. At first, critical reception was negative, claiming that the band could not be taken seriously due to their elaborate costumes. Some even claimed their performances were silly and more like a costume show. Keep in mind, Japanese consumers did not see Japanese artists typically dress or act like this. This was all very new to Japan at that time. This aesthetic and type of music was more typical of Western artists like David Bowie, Elton John, etc. Despite these negative remarks from critics, X began growing in popularity and selling thousands of records as an indie band long before they were signed by a big label. During these early days, the lineup of the band would constantly change, Yoshiki and Toshi being the only two that were cemented as permanent members. Though, this changed in 1985 as Taiji Sawada, or just Taiji, joined the band as the bassist. It was in 1987 when two more prominent members had joined, guitarist Pata and lead guitarist Hide. Hide is particularly interesting, being a cosmetology school graduate and guitarist for the band Saber Tiger, a band that rivaled X in popularity at the time, Hide's addition proved to be unexpected but invaluable. He would eventually contribute to the band as songwriter as well. Hide quickly became among X's most beloved members. It is also worth noting that by this time, in the late 80s, X was releasing music under their own record label. It was titled Ecstasy Records and owned by Yoshiki. Ecstasy Records also took on the releases of a few small acts, but it was short-lived and it's now inactive. 
X's first album, Vanishing Vision, was their only album released to Ecstasy. The band saw national recognition when signed by CBS Sony and their iconic second album, Blue Blood, was released in the spring of 1989. Could and I and Endless Rain, two of X's most beloved tracks, are from this album. If you needed just one song recommendation to hear what X is all about, listen to Could and I. It's an amazing song. While X saw a great deal of success at this point, this is also where the first of many controversies would come into play. X was at the height of their career in the late 1980s to early 1990s. Two years following the release of Blue Blood in 1991, X released their third album, Jealousy. This album was also very well received. Silent Jealousy is an amazing song as well. Highly, highly recommend. Also, kind of interesting tidbit I wanted to add because I'm a big Clamp fan, they actually did a music video for the manga titled X, much like their band, in 1992 and it's pretty sick, I'm a big fan of it. Clamp's manga X itself is pretty good, though unfortunately went on a hiatus in 2003, so it's unfinished. The movie is meh. This music video, though, I like it. Jealousy was significant for two reasons. One, it was the final album before X decided to change their name to X Japan. And two, this was the final album to feature Taiji as bassist. So, why did Taiji leave X? Or rather, why was Taiji fired from X and forced to leave the band following his final show at the Tokyo Dome in 1992? There is no definitive answer, but there are many fan theories. Being among the first big controversies, this topic had been debated and speculated upon for decades. Before we even get into those, here are some known facts. Following that final Tokyo Dome performance in 1992, which, by the way, was among three Tokyo Dome shows that all sold out very quickly, X made an official announcement and statement that they decided to let Taiji go due to musical differences. That was the only reason given, and the band refused to elaborate. They refused to elaborate further to this day. Though, in some interviews, it's been vaguely revealed that letting go Taiji was a difficult decision and Yoshiki was the one to break the news. He apparently did so at a bar, and breaking this news resulted in a fistfight breaking out between Yoshiki and Taiji. Yoshiki has also stated that this meeting with Taiji ended with both of them crying after the fistfight. Most elaboration on this topic was given in the 2016 documentary We Are X, though not much was really said. Yoshiki merely said that Taiji broke a rule within the band, and what he did was something he could not share or really forgive. According to Yoshiki, whatever Taiji did caused him to have to let him go, and it just had to be done. The other band members were also asked about this in the documentary, however their responses were cut from the final film. They really didn't add much or give any more information on what happened and what he did, what Taiji did, though they did say that the band was very different after his departure. Pretty much, that's what you can condense it to. Now, there's also Taiji's official statement regarding this in his autobiography. The reason Taiji gives was a distinct pay gap between him and the other members of the band that Taiji had addressed to Yoshiki, but still, that doesn't really add up. So, here are the most common theories for Taiji's departure. This is possibly the most common theory. Yoshiki said that Taiji broke a rule, and despite X's wild appearance, Yoshiki had supposedly implemented a no-drugs rule. Drinking? Fine. Smoking? Yeah, that was good too. But under no circumstances would drug use be tolerated. Yoshiki has stated that Taiji broke a rule. This could be the rule. Taiji was known to be temperamental and aggressive in demeanor. While other band members, specifically Hide, were known to be pretty outspoken and anger-prone, Taiji may have been worse and racked up too many arrests and fistfights for it to be tolerable anymore. This was technically the official reason given, and Taiji has said that he had a hard time getting along with Yoshiki in the past. A well-known fact is that during this time, Yoshiki went really hard in composing ballads and introducing more and more of them as time went on into X's music catalog. It has been said that Taiji was not a fan of this. 
This is a theory I've seen around on forums. While there's no proof of such an attempt taking place, it is worth noting and possible. And of course, this was the reason stated by Taiji himself, because it's only been stated by him who knows how much truth there is in the statement. This whole pay gap thing could very well be possible though. And really, it could be a combination of all these things. They could very easily coexist and mingle, creating the perfect storm for Taiji's departure. However, due to later circumstances that we'll discuss later on, we may never know the truth behind why Taiji was fired from the band. Following the controversy with Taiji, the band began seeking out new ventures, specifically attempting to break into the Western music scene. With this attempt came the release of the 1993 album Art of Life. This release featured one track completely in English and is well known for this one sole track. It's 29 minutes long and titled Art of Life. Art of Life featured an orchestration arrangement from the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra in London. Why just one long track though? Yoshiki, who wrote and arranged the song, says it was written during a time where he struggled with thoughts of and wanted to create something that represented his desire to keep going no matter what. Art of Life was recorded in different studios, most notably Yoshiki's recently acquired studio in North Hollywood. There was also recordings in Tokyo and even the famous Abbey Road studio in London. The album did very well in Japan, and critical reception even went as far as describing it as the Japanese stairway to heaven. Their attempt to break into the West, however, was an entirely different story. Sony had signed a deal with Atlantic Records in anticipation of a Western release. The deal fell through, supposedly because their English did not sound clear and their accents were too thick. Simply put, the higher-ups passed because X did not sound like native English speakers. It's worth noting that Yoshiki and Toshi both speak English. Toshi specifically has significantly improved in his English pronunciation. In 1993, however, how they sounded prevented their entry into the English-speaking world. Following this, the band entered a dark period, one filled with even more scandal and ultimately tragedy. Following the release of Art of Life, X, now titled X Japan, decided to take a short break and pursue solo projects. Notably, Hide decided to work on more alternative rock-geared music, being backed by the band Spread Beaver. Yes, that, that is their name. Hoshi sought out solo pursuits as well, releasing albums in 1992, 1994, and 1995, but saw issues in management early on. Initially, this task was given to his brother, who simply didn't seem fit for the position. He was fired and given a hefty severance. Following this, Toshi had issues with the next manager who was straight up stealing money from him. These events only seemed to foreshadow later events that would further take advantage of X's lead vocalist. This brings us to 1993 when Toshi met a woman by the name of Kaori Moritani. In 1993, Toshi starred in a musical version of Shakespeare's play Hamlet. He met Moritani during the production and the two quickly hit it off. Monitani is known by fans as essentially the Yoko Ono of X Japan. This is because this was the beginning of a series of events that would tear X Japan apart. As Toshi and Moritani grew closer, she began taking him to concerts produced by a <clears throat> group known as Home of Heart. This uh, group was one that Moritani was already a part of prior to meeting Toshi. As a matter of fact, Moritani was good, um, friends with the group founder, a man named Toru Kurabuchi, who went by the name Masaya. One night, Moritani had brought Toshi to one of Home of Heart's New Age concerts where Masaya was performing. Toshi was apparently blown away by this music, described by this group as healing music, quote-unquote. Moritani offered to introduce Toshi to Masaya since she, you know, knew him. <laughs> Following this encounter, Toshi and Masaya became friends and Toshi ultimately made Masaya his solo manager. Another decision that would eventually cause problems down the road. It was around this time that X Japan began to regroup and begin work on their next album, 1996's Dahlia. Unfortunately, Dahlia would be X Japan's final album. By this point, Toshi was very much involved with Home of Heart as well as Moritani and it began to show in his discord with X Japan as a whole. 
This was due to the influence of Home of Heart as well as Toshi's now fiance, Moritani. Dahlia saw a release in November of 1996 to an abundance of commercial success. It sold 500,000 copies and stayed at the top of the Oricon charts for 15 weeks. Not as long as the other previous releases, but still pretty good. Almost every track received separate releases as singles. Home of Hearts, specifically Masaya, began heavily criticizing Toshi for continuing to create music with X Japan, claiming his contributions to the band were corrupting the youth of Japan and that the band itself was pushing ideas and messages that were demonic. The fiancé, being very much a part of Heart of Home, also enforced this and urged Toshi to quit. Toshi began to believe the critiques of Heart of Home and began to think he was performing under a fake persona and not as his true self. He felt that he should pursue a more simplistic and natural musical persona. Media outlets at the time reported on the outlandish practices of Heart of Home and claimed Toshi was being brainwashed. Years later, Toshi would confirm that he was in fact brainwashed by them. So what is the deal with Heart of Home? What's their mission statement and what messages and other weird shit, for lack of better words, are they preaching? First and foremost, Masaya would hold what he called seminars. In said seminars, Masaya would encourage the members to give away their earthly attachments in lieu of their devotion to Home of Heart. This included giving up their money to Home of Heart. These seminars would also cost money and Toshi was encouraged to bring others and spread their word. Attending many seminars was a requirement in the quote-unquote training Masaya provided. And by training, I mean brainwashing. Members were told to worship only Masaya and complete their training to also become healing masters just like him. Toshi was told he must give up his ego quote-unquote to do so. And by ego, he meant give up X Japan and other luxuries. If Toshi went against Masaya's wishes, he would receive verbal and sometimes physical abuse. Masaya would call this feedback. So, in 1997, as his involvement with Heart of Home became even more deeply rooted into his life, he married Moritani. Only months later, Toshi had broke the news to his bandmates that he no longer wanted to be involved with X Japan. Yoshiki was furious, feeling as though he was losing his childhood friend above all else. Regardless, Toshi remained firm. Upon the official announcement in September of 1997, a farewell show titled The Last Live would take place on December 31st of 1997, the final day of the year. Heart of Home's hold on Toshi would only worsen from here as it extended to verbal threats and physical abuse more frequently. Within Toshi's biography, it's stated that the leader physically beaten him as punishment for performing with X Japan one final time within the Heart of Home basement. Even Toshi's own wife refused to remain at their home or support him at all at the Tokyo Dome where he was set to perform. Rather, she treated him as though he was being punished and said his involvement with his quote-unquote demonic band was impairing her training. So instead of supporting her husband and offering emotional support during this clearly difficult time that was, you know, kind of her fault, she instead went to Masaya's home and said she would be monitoring Toshi on the live TV broadcast with Masaya. TLDR, this woman's an abusive psychopath. The show itself was rough for the band and nobody really spoke to each other during the rehearsals and final show, especially Yoshiki and Toshi. The environment prior to performing was tense and bitter. It was difficult for everyone present. Now, the show itself was amazing. Just look at Yoshiki's work on the drums here. While Toshi's heart may have not been in it, everyone clearly gave it their all, and the show itself is among their all-time greatest live performances, maybe even the best of all of them. But once that show ended, that was it. Life after the disbandment of X affected the band members in a variety of ways. Toshi began solo work under the Heart of Home's own music label. Yes, they unfortunately have a music label. We'll revisit that in a bit. Yoshiki seemed to be met with an abundance of opportunities, having collaborated with various Western musicians, including Roger Taylor of Queen. Yoshiki would also briefly become a member of GLOBE, another popular band at this time. Heath and Pata would work with a variety of bands, most notably Pata with Hide and Spread Beaver. 
Hide himself would release three solo albums, the first being before the X Japan split in 1994 and the last being released in November of 1998. This third release was unfortunately posthumous. This brings us to possibly the biggest tragedy of X Japan, the death of Hide. Inarguably, the most notable outcome of the breakup was what became of Hide. This incident is by far the most tragic and monumental event in the entirety of X Japan's history, to the band of course, but to the fans as well. Hide, whose full name was Hideto Matsumoto, was known as the calm big brother of the group. He was often described as motherly and kind, aside from when he partook in drinking heavily. Hide was known to have violent outbursts when drunk, though he was also known to black out and forget these episodes. Overall, he was known as a very sweet and considerate person, though. Hide's career appeared to be flourishing in the spring of 1998. His third solo album was in the works, and his music was widely praised as being unique from his work with X Japan and had a more alt-rock vibe. It was through this outlet that he kept in touch with his former band members. Hide was already established as a talented songwriter as well. Hide's probably my favorite member of X Japan. He had such a unique presence and it cannot be replaced, not by anyone. There honestly will never be another Hide. Much like there's music before and after X, there's also X Japan with Hide and after Hide. Hide's passing rocked X Japan far beyond the initial break of the band. With Hide gone, the band would truly never be the same if they got back together. Could they even perform again? Could a force as powerful and vibrant as Hide even be replaced? Toshi continued to become further embedded into Home of Heart, pretty much becoming their poster child with his many musical releases under the Colts record label, yes, they're a cult, 100%. In case I didn't make that clear earlier. I'm not sure how much money from Toshi's music went to Home of Heart, but I'm sure a huge chunk of it did, you know, giving up your earthly possessions to Masaya and all that. By the way, Masaya is still his manager at this point. I'm gonna take this time to try and show you all of what Toshi's Home of Heart releases looked like. Please do not support these releases by purchasing them. The money is not going to Toshi and it's a really gross situation. Toshi himself even says he won't perform any of these tracks ever again as well. There are a lot of them and, you know, it's just bad. Don't, don't, don't support them. <clears throat> Anyways. Toshi released solo music to fund the leader under the Heart of Home record label. I've also read claims here and there that Moritani, the wife, also stole Toshi's music to use herself. I'm not sure how much truth there is to that, but I have read it here and there. I guess, you know, when not pursuing her day job as a horrible human being, she moonlights as a musician. Well, she had supposedly performed live 3,000 times with his Home of Heart label between 1999 and 2003. Another weird fact about Toshi's, um, wife is that she only lived with him as her wife for one year. After that one year, she moved in with someone. Can you, can you guess who that is? Yeah, it was Masaya. She was essentially cheating on Toshi with the Home of Heart leader because it was part of her training. Toshi also began serious amounts of debt despite all these music releases. He would ultimately file for bankruptcy. Following the breakup, Yoshiki began receiving more and more music opportunities following his brief involvement with Globe, the most notable of which being composer for the Emperor of Japan. Yoshiki almost did not accept such offers as he endured a period of not wanting to play music at all after losing Hide. Other pursuits of Yoshiki include providing a track to an instrumental Kiss tribute album, as well as writing music for a Korean rock band titled Tracks and also working on two motion picture soundtracks. Oh, he also has a Hello Kitty character. Her name is Yoshikiri. Now, we haven't really talked about Heath yet. He's the bassist that took over after Taiji was fired. Heath was personally acquainted with X long before joining as he actually performed with his previous band at a music festival produced by Ecstasy Records. This was way back in the early 90s. Heath has been in the Japanese metal visual case scene just as long as the other X Japan members at this point, and he's a pretty talented dude. Anyways, Heath and Pata, as well as Spread Beaver's percussionist, would go on to form a group called Dope Heads. The band debut album was released in 2000. 
they released two albums in total. The ex-Japan members did not formally get back together again until approximately 2006. This was when Yoshiki received a visit from Toshi in order to discuss and work on a song as tribute to Hide. This was when the band began coming back together once more. After almost 10 full years apart, this track would later become Without You. The official announcement of Toshi and Yoshiki working together again was made on Toshi's website in March of 2007. Toshi had also stated in the We Are X documentary that he was offered a very large sum of money to rejoin the band as a whole. Toshi actually spoke with Home of Heart regarding this, expecting them to completely shut down any thought of rejoining X. To his surprise, they did not. Because of this huge offer and payment, Masaya magically went back on his enforcement and told Toshiki to return. Because, you know, the money. Yoshiki around this time was also in a very brief and interesting group, one that only performed one sole time at Anime Expo in 2007 in Long Beach, California. This group consisted of Yoshiki, Miyavi, and Gakuto, and someone by the name of Sugizo that we'll talk about in a little bit. If you're somewhat familiar with J-pop and Visual K, then you would know that a combination of all these successful musicians is pretty dang cool. Gakuto, or Gakuto specifically, was a name I recall seeing a lot around the mid-2000s. Anyways, this band was called Skin, and they were very, very much short-lived. At this point, X-Japan had not officially announced their re-establishment, but rumors were all over the place. Especially when the group was spotted together in the rooftop of Aqua City, a location on the man-made island Odaiba in Tokyo in October of 2007. This would later be revealed to be the band filming a new track titled IV for the film Saw 4. That's kind of clever, right? The 4 in Roman numerals can also spell IV. You know, like a thing that goes in your veins. The even cooler thing about this track is it utilizes unreleased guitar recordings from Hide before his passing, so he was still a part of this track despite everything. This was not the only instance of Hide having a presence beyond his passing. We'll see some other creative methods of memorializing him in a bit. But see, there wasn't an infinite amount of guitar tracks from Hide that they could continue utilizing, and there was also the issue of performing live once again. Despite how difficult it would be, replacing Hide's role with the band would have to happen if they wanted to continue working together on future projects. For the time being, they resorted to inviting guest guitarists to play with them, particularly during their first live show as a reformed band on March 28th, 29th, and 30th in the Tokyo Dome, the same venue where they had their last live show in 1997. These shows were titled X Japan Resume Attack 2008, Ivy Towards Destruction. And these shows also made use of Hide's previous recordings. During the show's performance of Art of Life, a recording of Hide from a 1993 performance of the track was used as a hologram to play alongside the band. This did not come without issue as the band saw a few of those during this reunion show. The first show on the 28th was delayed for two hours. It's likely, though not confirmed, that this was due to issues with the Hide hologram. There are also later on issues when Yoshiki collapsed on stage. Now, I should add to that latter one that this happened many times before in past performances. You may recall me mentioning that Yoshiki had health issues as a child. These did not go away entirely as Yoshiki likely lives with chronic illness. He would often overdo it and collapse on stage even in the early days. People often just thought this was part of the show. At this point in 2008, the band members were in their 40s. Yoshiki collapsing like this, while his devotion to his art is nothing short of impressive, is more and more concerning as he gets older. During the other songs, aside from Art of Life, three different guitarists filled in. They were Wes Borland of Limp Bizkit, Richard Fortas of Guns N' Roses, and Sugizo. This brings us back to Sugizo. Yune Sugihara, better known as Sugizo, has been in the Japanese rock and metal scene since 1986. At this point, he was probably best known for his work with the band Luna C. Yet another clever play on words since it sounds like Lunacy. Sugizo also has experience running his own record label named Cross that he founded in 1997. He has produced music for other bands and has also released his own solo work under this label. He would later join Skin briefly and play at that X-Japan reunion show during that one night. 
On May 3rd of 2008, a show honoring Hide took place titled the Hide Memorial Summit. This show featured many well-known artists who came together to remember Hide on the 10th anniversary of his passing. In Japan, anniversaries hold a special significance. This includes the anniversary of somebody passing, as services are often held when specific anniversaries are reached. This also goes for music artists when they reach a debut anniversary. Sukizo performed with Lunacy at this show. Later that year, in September of 2008, Yoshiki had announced that a new song was in the works and that a tour would take place at locations throughout the world. It was that very next year, in 2009, that it was announced officially that Sugizo would officially join the band. Other notable events for X Japan during this time would be the announcement of their next official album. This would be their first album since losing Hide. The production of this album was long and rocky and confusing lasting 10 years and not released to this very day. Actually, it may still be in development. It's, again, very confusing. Two years later, X Japan would embark on their first North American tour. This was an impressive milestone since America was so difficult for them to break into in the early 1990s. The internet and the boom in popularity in Japanese culture likely played a huge part in their westward expansion. I personally discovered a lot of Japanese artists around this time through iTunes as well as anime, so it makes sense. This was not the only thing to happen in this year, though. Two big things happened, actually. First, there was the surprising announcement that Taiji would be rejoining X Japan as a guest bassist during some shows in August. This would not be a permanent role for Taiji, only temporary. After all, Heath had been replaced as the band's bassist for 18 years at this point. This led to more speculation regarding what the heck Taiji actually did to get kicked out of X. If he was brought back for a bit, it must not have been too horrible, right? But again, we'll probably never know. The next significant event was Toshi finally breaking free from his wife and filing for divorce, which was great for him as he was finally breaking free from Heart of Home and regaining his life. Toshi has spoken publicly about his divorce, stating him and his now ex-wife were, quote, effectively not husband and wife for nine of their 10 years of marriage. He also added that, quote, aside from having met her occasionally related to work, I do not know anything about her actual life. This is because she lived with Masaya instead of Toshi and was actively cheating on him. She's also widely thought to be a big part of the reason why Toshi was so severely in debt and had to file for bankruptcy. So at long last, Toshi was detaching from Heart of Home, a huge victory amidst so much controversy and tragedy in the years prior. Now we come to the unreleased album. This release would be, or should be, the sixth album in total and the first one without Hide. The official announcement was made in 2007 and production has been said to have lasted between 2007 and 2017. Yoshiki has made many contradictory statements and tweets regarding this unreleased album, saying the album was nearing completion and sometimes saying he wasn't sure if a full studio album was suited for today's digital age. In 2016, an album was released, though it technically was the soundtrack to the documentary film titled We Are X that was released the same year. There are new tracks on it, though this was apparently not the unreleased album. Only two songs, tracks 1 and 14, are new songs that debuted in this soundtrack. This soundtrack is not counted as a full album for this reason. Also around this time in 2016, Pata had been hospitalized due to severe complications with a blood clot. This would delay that unreleased album further. Pata was hospitalized for a year due to this, but he has since recovered, thankfully. The album was also said to be half new songs and half old songs re-recorded in English. Since 1993, Toshi's English proficiency has truly improved dramatically, so that latter part would be really cool to see. In an AMA on Reddit, Yoshiki would say that the band Duran Grey would provide backup vocals on some tracks of this new unreleased album. He also said other ex-Japan guitarists were filling in for Pata as he recovered. But alas, several release dates were announced and nothing was ever released on those dates. This project is still currently in development. 
Six Japan's last official tour was in 2017, and that sixth album still remains to be seen. To this very day, there has not been an official release since Hide's passing, an official album release that is, and I feel that's especially significant. Perhaps that's a part of the difficulty in seeing this album finally released and made public. For now, it's a pretty prominent piece of Japanese lost media as it's been confirmed and there are multiple completed tracks. As a matter of fact, four years ago in 2018, Yoshiki had said that the album is pretty much done and only needed to be mixed. In 2019, he also said that he's waiting for a good time to release it and also joked that it may take another 10 years. I personally feel that Hide's presence and memory is very much alive in the members of X Japan. Once this album is out, they'll have a full album release without Hide's involvement and physical presence. That's just my own thoughts, though. Hide's memory lives on in Japanese popular culture and remains celebrated. There have been Hide Museum exhibits and even a full Vocaloid produced in 2016 to attempt to recreate him musically. These posthumous Vocaloid projects also exist for Misora Hibari and Hitoshi Ueki. The morality of this has been debated, and it's a bit eerie hearing deceased musicians sing songs they didn't agree to sing, but it's also worth noting that these Vocaloids, Hide's included, are not commercially available to the public. Demo audio does exist where you can hear them all, I'll link that in the description. So what's X Japan up to today? Well, the members are all very active on social media, I've seen a few of their Instagrams, and Yoshiki is especially active. The current band lineup is Toshi, Yoshiki, Pata, Heath, and Sugizo. They all take on multiple roles in the band. Here's that chart I showed earlier, it gets a bit confusing because all of them are just, you know, so talented with their instrument proficiency. It's actually pretty interesting looking at this. Also, most of the members were featured in a rhythm game titled Ecstasy Visual Shock. It's a rhythm game that focuses on Visual K music. After all these years, now 40 years since 1982, when it all began, X Japan's legacy remains strong. Despite all this scandal, tragedy, and drama, X Japan remains among the most well-known musical acts in Japan. Even to those not into rock, X Japan is a household name. Most recognize Toshi and especially Yoshiki just by looking at them. Yoshiki faces issues with his health still, now suffering from carpal tunnel and back and neck issues. He has been told by doctors that his quality of life would improve if he just stopped performing or did the bare minimum instead. Despite that, Yoshiki continues doing what he loves and I respect that. It's part of what makes him a legendary musician. The solo band members and the band itself do make TV appearances every now and then too. Sometimes performing, sometimes not. While the future of X Japan and their future releases is uncertain, their past is not. The impact on Japanese music by X Japan is not. They are godlike figures in Japan and are finally seeing success in the Western world. Being seen as the talented rock musicians they are rather than being rejected based on a language barrier. As Yoshiki himself once said, the art of life is breaking the wall. And breaking down boundaries and paving their own path in music is what X Japan does best. I look forward to seeing what they accomplish next. Noriko Sakai was among the most well-known and beloved idols in Japan, Southeast Asia even. Until one day, she wasn't. Among the most noteworthy scandals of Japan within the last 50 years is definitely the controversy and total downfall of Noriko Sakai. A singer and actress who once upheld a pure and unadulterated image, appearing almost ethereal and unable to be tarnished. But once news broke of what Sakai was involved with in her personal life, as well as the lengthy scandal that followed, that image was completely destroyed. Today, we're gonna look at how that happened and why it is among the biggest scandals in Japan's recent history.
Looking at a Japanese idol or group of idols, be it from 50 years ago or just 5 days ago, what you typically see is something pretty safe. The word that comes to mind to me personally is sterilized. While not the case for every idol, talent, or just general entertainer in Japan, there is some level of a facade observed in each individual case. It's often concealed well, but there's sometimes these instances of scandal that allow the true personality and struggles of the person to escape and float to the surface. Suddenly, that eternally happy role model so many looked up to is just as flawed and human as everyone else. Reception to such scandal is oftentimes not well received, and the various ways the Japanese public react to these scandals is an issue in itself, a video topic for another day perhaps. Born on Valentine's Day of 1971 in Fukuoka City, Sakai pursued a life of music and entertainment as early as 1985, though had various interests in addition to this. She went back and forth between living in Saitama with her aunt and back in Fukuoka Prefecture. This was due to her father's changing marriage situation. Upon settling into middle school back in Fukuoka, Sakai had an active interest in softball, having won tournaments with her junior high school team. Her athletic pursuits were set aside when she decided to enter a 1985 talent competition brought forward by cosmetic brand Shiseido. At the time, it was reported that over 54,000 contestants entered this national competition. Now, Sakai herself did not win this competition, but she did get pretty far into it. The actual grand prize award went to an idol named Mari Mizutani. Sakai won an award dubbed the Bomb Show or Bomb Award. One that was non-existent in the past and made specifically to be awarded to Sakai as she did not win the grand prize though had a standout breakthrough performance. Winning this unexpected new award caught the attention of talent agency Sun Music who displayed an interest in seeing if she had any potential as an idol within their agency. Mari Mizutani would be contacted as well and both were signed to work with Sun Music in 1986 in preparation for a 1987 debut. The way the Japanese idol industry works is interesting. To briefly explain this process, the winners and standout performances of young people are often taken note of by talent agencies. During the late Showa period, various talent competitions would take place, most notably Star Tanjo. Though other competitions like Kimikoso Sutada or the Miss 17 contest conducted by Seventeen magazine in Japan. Long story short, there was an abundance of these contests and they were used by talent agencies to fish out new talent of the era. Sakai was among this new talent. From there, the recently signed idols are essentially trained to debut at a later date. This includes instruction on how to sing, dance, and ultimately shape the overall image and aesthetic the idol was meant to bring about prior to them becoming publicly known and seen by the public. That being said, Noriko Sakai initiated her professional career already surrounded by scandal, though back in 1986, the scandal she faced was not her own. Sun Music, the agency she was signed to, was still reeling from a recent incident. While among the most prominent of talent companies, they were faced with a great deal of negative press when Sakai was brought on board. Not due to Sakai, but because of a scandal relating to the late idol Yukiko Okada, who had been signed to Sun Music previously from 1983 to 1986. Sun Music is also known for promoting famous artists of the time like Yu Hayami and the legendary Seiko Matsuda. Also in 1986, the recently married Matsuda became pregnant and was expecting her first child in October. At this time, it was unknown if she would continue to be active as an idol following becoming a mother. This wasn't exactly typical. Sun Music was in search of new talent following the absence of Okada and Matsuda, the two very popular idols of the era that they were in charge of. Despite the current state of the company in 1986, Sakai's inclusion was later met with great success. 
Her first single, Otoko no Ko ni Naritai, was released on February 5th of 1987, only nine days before her 16th birthday, to positive reception under the Victor Entertainment record label. In total, Sakai released four singles and her first album, Fantasia Noriko Part 1, over the span of this year. However, none of these were her official debut. Sakai's official debut as an idol was in November of 1986. And it wasn't on vinyl, cassette, or even CD, not even on VHS or Laserdisc. Noriko Sakai's debut release was on VHD video. The 1980s gave birth to a plethora of weird media formats, many of which were pretty advanced for the time. There's Laserdisc, which is basically a giant vinyl record-sized disc that plays video. There's also D2 tapes, which are essentially giant VHS tapes. We're, we're getting off track here, I'm just talking about weird media formats. But the VHD. It's short for Video High Density, and as the name suggests, it's a video format that can accommodate dense files. They look like giant floppy disks. The benefit of these formats back then was that they could provide a clearer picture than that of a VHS release. Like CD versus cassette in terms of audio quality and memory storage, that, that kind of thing. VHD saw a release in Japan through the Japanese electronic company JVC, though the release was not very successful. Now, while the Laserdisc did do well in Japan, especially with its abundance of anime releases, the VHD did not. The machines debuted publicly in the early 80s, but production was discontinued by 1987. Now, Noriko Sakai is noteworthy because she is, apparently, according to what I have read, the very first idol to have a VHD release. Not only that, but she was the first idol to debut via a VHD release. And, you know, she probably is the only one. And on top of that, Sakai did not have just one VHD release, she had two. And, as the booklet with the first release suggests, is named after Noriko's apparent yuppie fashion sense. Many of the listed music videos on the actual box to these VHDs are viewable on YouTube, so they're not exactly lost media. So, no worries there about there being some lost Noriko Sakai media, at least to my understanding. Anyways, from here, Sakai continued to grow in popularity, especially over the late 1980s, as her career at this time was heavily focused on music. And photo books, which are pretty standard as far as idols go. They're basically books where the idols will model and take photos, and they're compiled and people buy them. It, that's basically it. And at the very end of 1987, she was awarded the Best Newcomer Award at the 18th Annual Nippon Kaio Award Show. Beginning in 1988, Sakai would see even more success in use of her music within different outlets. And at this very same time, recently established animation studio Gainax was beginning to become mainstream. While yeah, most people today are more familiar with the studio, as well as their iconic anime like Neon Genesis Evangelion, Pantheon Stalking, Karekano, and um, Ebichu, back in the late 1980s they were pretty small and pretty niche. Having only been established in 1984, their biggest works early on were short animations shown at conventions back when they were called Daikon Film, and only a small group of college students. All of this changed when they created the film Oritsu Uchugun Oneamisu no Subasa in 1987. Then, in 1988, they released the cult classic OVA series Topo o Nerai, more widely known as Gunbuster. Now, what does this have to do with anything you may be asking? First, I was talking about weird video formats, now anime. Well, I'm, I'm getting there, I assure you. So, it can be argued that the biggest milestone at this early point in Sakai's career was her contribution to Gunbuster. And while both the main character and voice actress for the main character were also named Noriko, that isn't what Sakai is credited for. Rather, it's for the opening theme as well as two of the three ending themes. This was during a time when anime was beginning to adopt the use of pop music in openings and endings. This trend began roughly in the early 80s with anime like Cat's Eye and the later Urusei Yatsura openings that's just kind of expected now. Back then, it wasn't really as commonplace, but it was getting there. 
And with Gunbuster being the first commercial success of Gainax, Sakai's inclusion set her musical career on the right track, or rather, further on the right track than it already was. And this was not the only anime Sakai provided music for, there are a few others, which you can see right now. The songs featured in the Gunbuster OVA were featured on Lovely Times Noriko Part 3, which was her third studio album by this point. This third album tied with Ganbare Noriko Part 2 as her most successful studio album of all time. Both albums were released that same year in 1988, and by this point, Sakai was only 17 years old and not even out of high school. It's pretty safe to say that by this point, Sakai was successful and busy. She garnered the nickname Noripi, which was based upon a character that Sakai drew herself in her own likeness. According to Sakai, both the nickname Noripi and the character were created back in middle school. The Noripi character in itself saw an abundance of success, with Sakai acting as an illustrator and creating manga, merchandise, and even PSAs featuring Noripi. Idols having cute illustrated caricatures in their likeness was anything but uncommon at this time, but Noripi took it to another level. Multiple stores at the time opened selling goods of her character. These stores were called Noripi-chan houses. These celebrity merchandise stores were also pretty common and known as Tarento Shopu or talent shops. The very first Noripi-chan house location was at a station at Mount Fuji. Articles at the time named it Japan's highest talent shop because, you know, the elevation of Mount Fuji. A second Mount Fuji location was later opened as the Noripi merch proved to be very popular. In 1991, there was even a racing team that used her character, with Noriko Sakai acting as their coach. Truly an interesting time to be alive. Noriko Sakai continued to see success through typical outlets and idol would pursue. There was her continued musical releases, in addition to multiple photo books and her appearances on TV in small acting roles or interviews or, you know, performing her actual music on TV. Media outlets at the time viewed her with an abundance of positivity, even boasting about healthy rivalries between Sakai and other artists of the time. This included Rie Hatakeda, Risa Tachibana, Babe, and Fuyumi Sakamoto. But as the 90s began, so did a new, more mature image for Sakai. As a matter of fact, a lot of things were changing in Japan at the time, for Japan as a whole. Following 1991, as Noriko Sakai entered her 20s, she decided to eventually retire the Noripi brand. Simply stating that she was now too grown up for such a cute and childish mascot, and that she felt it was not suitable for her image in her 20s. While this choice was meant to be perceived as a choice made by Sakai herself, it should be noted that the Noripi brand was pretty much ran and managed by Sun Music, not Noriko Sakai herself. It's even been stated by Hidetate Aizawa, the former president of Sun Music, that the Noripi brand was only meant to promote Noriko Sakai as a debuting performer and was not to be seen as a long-term venture. The typical idol image was also becoming rather stale and losing its appeal at the time. With Japan's ideal bubble era of the 1980s coming to an abrupt end with the downfall of the economy, Japan had entered what was called the Lost Decade. And the performers Japan wanted to see was shifting to entertainers with a more holistic and realistic appeal, such as bands or musicians. Not really idols that were created by a corporation with an image that was, you know, created by a bigger corporation. So, that Showa idol image was dying out. And even if Sakai's professional career did end there, she would be remembered fondly as a prominent idol of the era. Especially when combining this with the success of the Noripi character. When considering most idols of the time and how many of them there were and how many of them made music and how many of them were just simply forgotten with, you know, the overabundance of it, she did pretty well. Was this the end of her success, though? No, absolutely not. Actually, one could argue that this was only the beginning. That's because, at this point in time, Sakai became heavily involved in creating music in Chinese. 
With her idol image slowly fading out in Japan, Sakai began seeking out opportunities in countries like China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. During the early 90s, Sakai began to break out and widen her fan base throughout Southeast Asia, even performing various concerts and releasing multiple songs in Chinese. Though, meanwhile, in Japan, more opportunities were about to become available to her. Aside from the damaged economy, 90s Japan was considered noteworthy for its boom in television dramas. As a matter of fact, the early 90s were especially considered a golden age for Japanese Wednesday dramas. These are, as you may have guessed, dramas that aired during an allotted time slot on Wednesdays. There's also the Asa Dorama or morning drama that are typically about 15 minutes per episode and air in the morning. The very famous and very depressing 80s drama Oshin was an Asadora, or morning drama. Anyways, the longer dramas produced during this time in the early 90s were known as Torendi Dorama or trendy dramas, as they often involved stylish young people living in the city and experiencing all those exciting things associated with being trendy and young, particularly romance. This trend in media technically began in the late 80s, and the trendy drama are also noteworthy for reflecting lavish bubble economy lifestyles even after that bubble popped. A standout trendy drama I would personally recommend from this era would be 1991's Tokyo Rabustari or Tokyo Love Story, if you really want to experience that bubble economy romance young city energy. But anyways. At this time in the early 1990s, Sun Music had recently lost two more of their most prominent talents. Well, technically they gained one back and then lost her again. See, while Seiko Matsuda saw a successful return to entertainment following her marriage and becoming a mother, she decided to leave Sun Music and manage herself independently during the early 90s. Yu Hayami, who we mentioned a little earlier and who is another popular idol, left the office by this time as well. With the decline of idols and the loss of these big names, Sun Music turned to a new venture. And what was this new venture? The trendy drama. This brings us to Shinji Nojima, a famous screenwriter who wrote many beloved dramas of this era. Nojima, when casting for these drama series, reached out to Sun Music and made use of the talent promoted by the company. Among this talent was Sakai. While fresh off her success in the Chinese-speaking world, Sakai had played brief and minor roles here and there throughout her career. Acting was not something she was completely unfamiliar with, but her roles in the past were not frequent, nor did they involve any main characters. However, this all changed in 1993 when Sakai was casted in Nojima's drama, Hitotsu Yane no Shita, or Under One Roof. The plot is somewhat similar to the American drama Party of Five, kind of actually not really, as Under One Roof involves six children being separated and raised apart following the death of their parents in a car accident. The eldest son, played by actor Yosuke Eguchi, grows up and fosters the goal of reuniting his family and finding his lost siblings, so that they can all live under one roof. Noriko Sakai played the eldest sister of the separated Kashiwagi family. Her role was noteworthy in her career as she played a character who was her married boss's mistress. In other words, she was playing a woman who was having an affair with a married man. This was something a bit more mature when compared to her early work as an idol. Under One Roof was a massive success and very well received by viewers and critics alike. Later on, in 1995, Sakai saw further success acting when cast in the romance drama Hoshi no Kinka, or Gold Star Coin, in the lead role. In this drama, partially written by Shinji Nojima, she played Aya Kuramoto, a girl who was both deaf and mute. This series also saw great success, and Sakai saw a great deal of praise for her performance within it. Her acting talent was not the only thing acclaimed in Hoshi no Kinka, as Sakai also performed the opening theme, Aoi Osagi or Blue Rabbit. Aoi Osagi is her best-selling single to date. Both Hitotsu Yane no Shita and Hoshi no Kinka received a sequel series, being released in 1996 and 1997 respectively. Both of these sequel series were also well-received. 
By the late 90s, Sakai had been involved in many acting projects, and this revived and matured image saw a great deal of success throughout the 1990s in Japan. It could be argued that Sakai was at the highest point in her career as the 90s were nearing their end. It was also around this time when she met a professional surfer named Yuichi Takaso. When exactly isn't completely known, as a matter of fact, a lot of details surrounding Takaso are a bit murky. While Takaso is described as a professional surfer, many media outlets in Japan identify him as a self-proclaimed pro surfer. This is because his name is not listed under professional players recognized under the JPSA. So has he entered a lot of surfing competitions? What exactly is the deal there? According to Takaso himself, he wasn't registered because he didn't enter too many competitions. Yet, despite that, he was still a professional surfer because he was good at it and because he had sponsors and was, quote, making a living off of it. As far as Takaso's actual profession, his family was pretty wealthy and owned a ski shop that he was set to inherit. The shop is called Ski Shop Jiro and at one point had three locations. While an exact date isn't known, a word around that time was that Ryuichi Kawamura, lead singer of rock band Luna C, was friends with Takaso and Sakai had met him through Kawamura. From here, the group would go surfing together. There's also word that Shizuka Kuro, a good friend of Sakai, joined the group to go surfing. It is possible that Sakai and Takaso got to know each other through these meetups to go surfing and whatnot. None of these details are confirmed, however. What is official was the official press conference Sakai held in order to formally announce her marriage to the public. While Western celebrities don't make official announcements to an audience regarding their personal life milestones, typically, this is very commonplace in Japan. So, in December of 1998, Sakai officially announced to her fans that she had married Takaso. This was met with much controversy and negative reception, mainly aimed at Takaso. This is because the biggest thing Takaso was known for at the time was his infamy as a rich playboy. Not for the surfing or the ski shop, but this one detail. Tabloids at the time had very little faith in him serving as a loyal husband to Sakai and felt she simply deserved better. Mainly, the public was outspoken towards this marriage out of concern for Sakai. This concern would, unfortunately, become warranted eventually. Though this was not the end of the announcements and surprises. What was not yet known at this time was that Sakai was three months pregnant at the time of her marriage to Takaso. During this time, Sakai decided to take time off from her professional career to see out her pregnancy as well as take time to be a new mother. Following the marriage, the couple moved to Hawaii and from here on July 17th of 1999, Sakai gave birth to her first and only child, a son named Yuki. Sakai spent the remainder of that year with her husband and son. Despite these significant changes to her professional life, Sakai intended to eventually return to her life as a performer. Though, amidst all the controversy of her marriage and new responsibilities as a mother, would she return to the same success she became acclimated to? Or would she be met with further scandal and backlash as time went on? Unfortunately, a combination of both would be observed by Sakai as this was only the beginning of her story, and we are only reviewing the prequel of her downfall as a beloved entertainer. Noriko Sakai was at among the highest points in her career in 1999, with the turn of the century rapidly approaching, so were many changes in her lifestyle and career. Who was once this innocent and fresh-faced idol, as far as the public eye was concerned, was now the sophisticated and mature actress. No longer a cutesy teenager, but a mature woman. Again, as far as the public eye was concerned. Now, as far as Sakai herself was concerned, she had also taken on new roles that were a little more close to home. Quite literally. Because, in addition to career changes, she had also taken on the roles of both wife and mother, one right after another. This was likely the biggest game changer for her thus far. Not only in her newfound responsibilities, but also in her appearance to the public. 
We briefly touched upon this in part one, but idols becoming married and having children was often a death sentence when it came to their careers. It may sound outlandish, old-fashioned even, kind of dramatic or ridiculous, but it does happen still. Even something as small and trivial as dating somebody for an idol can ruin their careers, especially if they're still teenagers and somewhat young and used for that specific image that the company that's promoting them is, you know, giving them. One notable example just off the top of my head right now is Matsumoto Iyo. I recall seeing a variety show with her being interviewed in her 40s or 50s, and she actually said that while on a date with a boy, she had to cover herself with a blanket while in his car and going through a toll road like a freeway, just so she wouldn't be spotted and her career wouldn't be ruined. Those are the extreme lengths that idols, especially back in the Showa era, have had to go through simply to keep their careers intact and their images untarnished, as ridiculous as that sounds. Celebrities aside, it's still somewhat common for working women to quit their jobs after marrying or becoming pregnant to assume their new role of housewife. Simply out of cultural expectations, I mean, some may want to and enjoy doing that, which is awesome, but some may simply feel expected to do so. Again, this is becoming less common in recent years, and it was more common back in the old days, I suppose, but it still does happen. Now, add to this the constant scrutiny of being in the public eye when famous, a public that may be a bit infatuated with the attractive and ideal celebrity they have in their head. With that in mind, one could see how being public about starting a family and being married to someone could be rough on their career. That is, if they so choose to continue it. There already was outcry regarding Sakai's now husband, seen by the public as a bad boy and notorious flirt. Rich playboy was another term thrown around in the tabloids a lot. Yuichi Takaso, as he is named and his name is, was basically a foil to Sakai's more innocent and demure appearance. All of that aside though, despite all the scrutiny from fans and tabloids alike, Sakai seemed happy in her marriage and happy as a new mother and wife. In all honesty, the public didn't know anything about their marriage or how they got along as a couple or what they did in their private life. She seemed happy and that should have been all that mattered. Though, I really do mean it when I say that nobody knew what was going on in her private life at this point. We're getting there, I, I promise. Remember the Nori P brand discussed back in part one? In the years following her departure from that brand, she did create her own clothing line following this. The clothing brand, Pipi Ricorino, appears to have done well and even saw a crossover with Hello Kitty at one point. Sanrio doesn't collab with just anyone, mind you. The name, Pipi Ricorino itself, is derived from a mixture of Sakai's name, the English word produce, and the Italian word pino, which translates to cute. I do also want to add that this project was funded and supported by Japanese trading company Itochu, a corporation known for being among Japan's largest sogo shoshas, a term for a company dedicated to the trading and distribution of products to the public. So, what's the takeaway from all this knowledge? That Sakai had a lot going for her at the time. However, Sakai did ultimately return to being a singer and actress. Whether or not the public would positively receive this return was yet to be seen. But in what ways did she return? So, Sakai began her involvement in film, drama, and commercials once more. This technically began at the start of 2000 with two separate roles. One being a new drama, and the other being voiceover in a Pokemon animated short. The drama was called Tenchi ga Kieta Machi, or The City of Angels, or The City of Pure Souls. This drama starred two male leads and had Sakai in a supporting role as one of the love interests. This was not a role comparable to her prominence in Aoi Usagi, though a strong role nonetheless. 
Now, Pokémon, on the other hand, was something very popular in the year 2000. By this year, it was all over the place in the West, as well as well-established and loved in its home country since 1997. Aside from one minor slip-up. TLDR, and I'm really trying to make this a TLDR because I love Pokémon, this game and anime series had taken Japan by storm in 2000, and her inclusion in one of the shorts was pretty big for that time. What she essentially provided was a narration for the 23-minute short that played before the third Pokémon film, known as Pocket Monsters the Movie, Emperor of the Crystal Tower, Entei, in Japan. This film and short debuted in Japan on July 11th of 2000. That very next year, Sakai was cast in the TV drama Honke no Yome, or My Marriage, though again, Sakai was not in the lead role. That went to Taiwanese singer and actress Vivian Su. In the years following this, Sakai was cast in various roles and had a steady involvement in the entertainment industry, never quite seeing the success witnessed with Aoi Usagi, but still relevant in Japan. Now, as far as Asian countries outside of Japan, that's a whole other story. Sakai not only retained her success overseas, but grew more so in popularity as the years went on. Being especially popular in countries like Hong Kong, Thailand, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Her popularity in these countries far surpassed her success in Japan. Now, don't be fooled, while Sakai didn't see massive success following her marriage, she was cast in one especially prominent lead role, this being for Juon the Grudge 2. In this film, she played Kyoko Harase, a famous scream queen or horror film actress filming a TV episode in a cursed home. The film itself wasn't super well received, as critics described the film as repetitive and cheesy in parts. She would perform in a couple other films following this, however. And then there were the commercials. Noriko Sakai would be featured in many commercials in Japan and elsewhere in Asia. She was featured in a tremendous amount of ads during her time as an idol, however, and the amount of ads showcasing her after that were far more modest. That aside, among her biggest commercial partnerships were a series of Toyota ads from the mid to late 2000s. As far as music, where Sakai had her start, she did produce four singles after 2000. To not making the Oricon singles chart, with the best performing single reaching 42 on the charts. Japanese celebrities are often very private in their, well, private life. Despite that, Sakai was often photographed with Takaso, her husband, throughout the 2000s. One distinct aspect to note was their choice of dress and apparent demeanor when in her normal life as opposed to her image in her various entertainment roles. Take the Toyota ads, for example. Here, she plays a gentle mother. Even the color palette of the commercial itself suggests the theme of a quiet and peaceful family life. I must once again bring up the term sterile here, as I did in part one. There is actually a term for this type of Japanese entertainer, a term used for the former idol pure housewife type that began being coined during this time. This term being a mamadoru, a combination of mama and idol. Though, her demeanor in real life didn't really appear to reflect this, and this was apparent just by the still images and brief glimpses the public got of her and her family. So, what of the marriage itself? In photos, they still looked happy, though these photos of the family together were rather sparse as Sakai was often very busy and not at home. While her various roles weren't huge, she did have a lot of them and was often observed as being very busy and away from home due to entertainment pursuits. Often for long periods of time. This is very typical of an entertainer, though Sakai was described as going the extra mile and taking on a lot of work. It was in the late 2000s when some rather odd aspects of their marriage came to light. The most distinguishable of which being an unnamed woman who frequently visited Sakai's homes and was strangely close to Takaso. Much of the time, this woman would visit when Sakai was away. She was often seen with Sakai's son as well and described as being similar in appearance to Sakai herself. 
Now, one could easily draw conclusions here, especially when Takaso was known as a playboy prior to their marriage. Though, what if I told you that Sakai was well aware of this woman? Well, Sakai was, and this is where it gets a bit bizarre. Sakai was questioned about this woman by tabloids once. Her response was noted as not being concerned. She even laughed it off, claiming this woman was her close friend and quote-unquote like a sister to her. It was suggested that this mystery woman was often called upon to care for her son and that the son was actually quite fond of her. With the combination of statements and sightings, it appeared that this close friend was called upon to care for Sakai's husband and son while she was away fulfilling career obligations. But that's still pretty odd. And it gets even more odd. Following this, it also came to light that this woman would also party with Sakai and Takoso quite frequently. This information was given by some friends of Sakai who were later asked about the woman by media outlets. Not only did Sakai and her husband's partying come to light, which is a scandal-inducing issue in itself in Japan, but more weirdness with the friend came to light as well. Many claim that this woman lived with them full-time and would often vacation with the family. Another statement claimed that Sakai was the one living with the family part-time, that Sakai and Takaso began living in their own separate homes in the late 2000s, that the female friend was the one living with the family permanently. It was also stated by people that the trio would do odd things together. One was bathing together. Now, communal bathing is very much a common thing in Japan, refer to onsens and bathhouses for more on that, but a married couple and another adult woman in a private home? Nope, not really. Now, given the information I have already provided you guys with, it's possible you've drawn your own conclusions and kind of figured out what this could have been, this situation with the trio. It is very possible that the trio could have been polyamorous, in that they were all just a romantic couple, like as a trio, but I'm not sure if that's the case. In Japan, that wasn't really something that was widely known or understood. Japan today still doesn't really have a firm grasp on a lot of LGBTQ um, elements, so I'm not sure about that. It could have also been just possible that Takaso was sleeping around with her and Sakai was just, you know, okay with it. She was just kind of done with the marriage and was like, whatever. I'm simply stating what the tabloids I read kind of pictured this whole ordeal as and just kind of going with that, just kind of presenting it as it was seen then. Anyways, moving on. Even beyond this, it was further confirmed that this family friend was seen to be inappropriately close to Takaso in private. One person who attended one of their parties noticed that Takaso and the friend were very close on the couch. This was in the early morning following the party itself. Their eyes were described as glazed and they appeared out of it. Sakai was also present and paid no mind to them. Instead, according to this witness, Sakai just turned on music and started dancing by herself in that same living room while Takaso and the friend just kind of sat there. So, compared to the Noriko Sakai we've been discussing so far, this was pretty different. With these strange details coming to light, it was clear that the Noriko Sakai the public thought they knew really wasn't her. Now, tabloid gossip and marital issues don't make for a huge scandal in Japan. Nothing life-altering, though what was about to make itself known next definitely was. This is what occurred on August 4th of 2009. The use of illegal substances have extreme repercussions and are very frowned upon in Japan. That's absolutely no secret. So, just how strict is Japan about such offenses? Now, while some substances are legal in other countries, the use of cannabis is an example of one that is just as illegal as any other illegal substance there is. Basically, Japan's anti-cannabis laws are among the strictest in the world. While this plant definitely has its history in Japan, the country really cracked down on it with a 1942 law. If you have it in your possession in Japan, you are at risk of up to five years of imprisonment. 
They do not mess around, I assure you. Notable examples of this type of possession in Japan include Paul McCartney being arrested for possession of it in Tokyo in 1980. McCartney faced five years of struggles preceding this just trying to get his band Wings the opportunity to just perform in Japan. The country made it so difficult because McCartney was known to have consumed illegal substances in the past. I mean, that's no secret. There's also Saya Takagi, who I've discussed in one of my Lost Media shorts. Takagi was an actress who was blacklisted because she supported the legalization of cannabis in Japan. The various roles she was credited for acting in pretty much wiped from existence due to this. She has a drama that is completely lost now. I can't even find images of it. All because of her stance and opinions on this one topic. Another example is that of Pierre Taki. This Japanese actor is credited with many voice roles, among which was Olaf in the Japanese dove of the movie Frozen. This actor was caught with illegal substances a few years back. Because of this arrest, all of Olaf's lines in the Japanese dub of Frozen were dubbed over by another actor. All because of Taki's now tarnished reputation. And this brings us back to Sakai, as the unapologetic effects of this type of scandal would now apply to her. August 4th of 2009, Sakai's husband was at a public park in the Minato ward of Tokyo. He entered a bathroom that drew the attention of police nearby, though no action was taken that day. It was the very next day on the 5th that the suspicion allowed law enforcement to find Takoso's vehicle, now parked in the Shibuya ward, and search the inside. In Japan, just the suspicion that somebody is under the influence of something is enough to search a vehicle, mind you. It was within this vehicle that 0.8 grams of a stimulant were discovered. This gave the Tokyo Metropolitan Police permission to go beyond this and search everything and everyone related to Takoso's family most notably Sakai. Following the vehicle search, Takaso was arrested when they found him walking around Shibuya. This turned to a full body search where even more substance was discovered in his undergarments. This further progressed the gravity of the situation. Wasting no time, the police called Sakai directly, requesting that she physically come to the scene in Shibuya. Takaso was immediately brought to the police station. Sakai did show up, and this was when she was told that she would be required to submit various tests to verify if she was also under any influence. In Shibuya, in the face of law enforcement, Sakai agreed. Though, she had a condition. Sakai explained that her son, now just about 10 years of age, was waiting for her at school, as class was just about to get out. Sakai explained that she had to tend to her son first, and that this was time-sensitive and important that she not leave him alone. Sakai's responsibilities as a mother, the reason why she could not take those tests right now. The police agreed and allowed her to go pick up her son and agreed that she could return to the station to take those tests by the end of that day. Well, Sakai did pick up her son, Though, following this was when Sakai fled Tokyo and disappeared. This is where that family friend came back in. It was found that Sakai dropped off her son with this friend before fleeing. So wherever Sakai went, her son did not go with her. Meanwhile, at the station, Takaso immediately confessed that his wife was using stimulants as well. He claimed that they had done so together about a week prior while on a family vacation. The truth behind this is unclear, as around this time it was definitively confirmed that Sakai was not living with Takaso and did in fact have her own separate apartment in Tokyo. Now, this apartment was also searched and 0.08 grams of the stimulant Takaso also had in his possession were found. This gave authorities the okay to issue a warrant for Sakai's arrest. Now, by this point in time, the scandal had spread like wildfire through Japanese media outlets, with the details of the family's personal life put on blast, including more details involving that family friend. 
This friend was soon questioned as well, and one infamous detail of said questioning is her essentially going into hysterics, shouting and not complying with the police, essentially described as a tantrum. The fact that Sakai was missing in action added more fuel to the fire. Where did she go? How long did she plan to hide? Would she just remain in hiding, not seeing her child and hoping everything would just go away if she didn't face it? Authorities attempted tracking Sakai through her cell phone, though the phone itself was broken and discarded around Yamanashi Prefecture about an hour outside Tokyo. This phone was thought to have further details regarding Sakai's habit, which is likely why the phone was broken and discarded. The public wouldn't have to wait long for Sakai to surface once again, however. On August 7th, just two days following her disappearance, Sakai returned to Tokyo and turned herself in. Sakai was soon questioned regarding what was found at her home. Sakai simply claimed that she was not going to use it and was simply storing it. That same day, a search of the family beach house in Chiba Prefecture found various illegal substances as well, which she also denied using. Takaso, on the other hand, admitting to using all of them found and was met with multiple charges of possession. And those tests that Sakai avoided were finally administered as well. The urine test came out negative, though that was likely because Sakai fled for a couple days and had not taken anything in the days she was missing. When Sakai had returned and turned herself in, it was noticed that her hair color had slightly changed. This was likely due to dyeing it and removing anything that would prove her guilty of any possession or use of substance. Despite this, the hair test did come out positive. And with that positive result, Sakai was officially charged with possession as well. It was a little over one month later, on September 17th of 2009, that Sakai was released from prison. Her first task following this was a public press conference with her, her attorney, and Sun Music president Masahisa Aizawa. Sakai was met with a huge crowd as she publicly apologized for her actions, stating, and I quote, My weakness caused me to give in to illegal drugs and cause grief to many people. I pledge to repent and atone for this crime for the rest of my life. With that, Sakai vowed to seek help and recover, requesting that she be allowed to do this in private. Sakai never saw prison time for her crime. Instead, she simply received a warning to remain clean to avoid the prison sentence later on in 2012. This is an exceptionally lenient sentence in Japan, though Sakai's many ventures and collaborators would not be anywhere close to this lenient. The first of many cancelled contracts occurred when Toyota immediately pulled all the commercials she was featured in, refusing to work with her moving forward. And her voiceover in that Pokemon short? That one nine years prior in the year 2000? Any and all sales and showings of the short were banned. Copies of the film, with her voiceover included, were pulled from all store shelves, and no longer sold to this day. The original version of the short has not been shown or distributed again following this, not once in the past 14 years. The home video copies of the short that were already sold aren't rare by any means though, and are easily obtainable on sites like eBay. And what of Sakai's clothing line? Discontinued immediately and pulled from all store shelves. In 2009, her clothing line consisted of at least 150 unique articles, all removed from stores. Among the biggest fallouts was with her record label, Victor, who took action in withdrawing all copies of her CDs from stores on August 9th. This was the day she officially was charged. This caused sales of her singles digitally to skyrocket briefly on stores like iTunes as well as all her CD releases selling for ridiculous amounts of money on Amazon. Regardless of this, Victor Entertainment broke off any and all partnership and distribution of her music permanently. 
And it didn't end there. Following her public apology, Sakai was let go from Sun Music, the agency that had represented her since her debut in the mid-1980s. Sun Music had become absolutely clear in their intention of wanting absolutely nothing to do with Sakai from that point forward. Her official webpage was taken down and any pending entertainment connections and opportunities were severed. Sakai was left with no sponsorships, no record label, and no management. The partnerships lost worth literally billions of yen. The career and legacy she spent literally decades building had crumbled to ruin in the span of one month. It was all gone. One year following all this scandal, Sakai officially divorced Takaso. His influence likely the worst thing to have if genuinely trying to heal and recover. With that influence out of the way, the rest of her recovery was truly on her. But here we are. Did Noriko Sakai take her actions and the consequences of her actions seriously? Did she truly clean up her act and attempt to recover? Well, Sakai has actually taken a genuine proactive route in bettering herself since the scandal. Most notably, she attended college and received a bachelor's degree in welfare and nursing in 2013. This is something she had initiated immediately following the aftermath of the entire scandal. Sakai has also toured around countries like China as an activist against drugs discussing the many dangers and negative circumstances of using them. Sakai did attempt to return to the entertainment world for a second time in 2012. This was in a small play that saw an audience of 7,000 people. As far as management, Sakai has been associated with a couple small management companies. This included company Nigun Niba. As of 2021, however, Sakai is self-managed by her newly created company, Smile. But what is Sakai doing in the present day? What is she involved in? So, as far as a conclusion to the story, as in how Sakai is doing in the present day, an interesting development actually occurred pretty recently. That development being NFTs. Yes, I'm serious. Sakai re-recorded her famous single, Aoi Usagi, in 2021 and created various NFTs to celebrate this. Now, as far as Takaso, her now ex-husband, he has done absolutely nothing in terms of learning from his mistakes and recovering. In 2010, after he was released from prison, he disappeared on an extended vacation with his parents making no remark regarding this or saying if he was leaving to clean up his act or just escape the public eye. Takaso would later be arrested and charged with possession yet again, the latest one being in 2020. So, unfortunately, Takaso seems to be involved with the same things that caused this big scandal in 2009. Honestly, when looking into this entire scandal, I really felt the most for her poor son. He was just a child and really did not need to get thrown into all this. Luckily, Yuki hasn't been present online or in the public eye too much following the scandal, and I genuinely hope he experienced a normal and pleasant upbringing following everything that happened. As of this year, he's now well into his 20s and still lives a very private life. There was a very brief sighting of him in a recent social media post by Sakai, but that's about it, you can't even see his face. And again, I'm really happy to see this. So, consider this a tale meant to educate and inform. A tale somewhat cautionary in nature regarding the dangers of Sakai's lifestyle. One that likely hurt her son, those who cared about her, and definitely hurt her entire career and reputation. Also consider this an example of the sterilization of Japanese celebrity, especially idols. How greatly an image can differ from who the person actually is. How fragile that image can be when treated irresponsibly, as with what happened with Sakai. Sakai herself seems to have healed as a person, and that is truly great. 
While I absolutely cannot relate to Sakai's scandal in any way, I do know for certain that without your health and control over your quality of life, you really don't have much, if anything at all. This is coming from myself, somebody who has struggled with a chronic illness that leaves me largely bedridden. There was a solution for Sakai to improve herself physically and she took it. Who knows if she would have without this scandal. However, as far as recovering her professional career and the status of a beloved singer and actress, who knows if she'll be welcomed back into that world with the same warmth ever again. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. If you're familiar with City Pop, you may be already familiar with the name Nakahara Meiko. If not, allow me to briefly explain what City Pop is. In the 1980s, Japan was in what's called a bubble economy. Long story short, it meant they had a lot of money. With this era came a lot of creations, one of these being new modernized synth pop music. Ironically, back then, Japanese people called it new music. It's still called new music today, not City Pop. That's actually a name given to it in the West. While a lot of that 80s Japanese money went to promoting Showa idols, a thing that was also quite huge back then, new music was classified as more of the chill yuppie jams for young adults to listen to while they drove on the freeway or went on a classy dinner cruise. The latter was also very popular in 80s Japan. City Pop is not solely a creation of the 80s, however. To quote Google, City Pop is a loose category of Japanese pop music that emerged in the late 70s and peaked in the 80s. In Japan, the tag is simply referred to music that projected an urban feel and whose target demographic was urbanites. So, where does Nakahara Meiko fit into all this? Well, she created a lot of banger tracks during this time period and even supplied a couple equally banger anime openings. Any fan of Dirty Pear or Kimagure Orange Road does not need to be told that. Nakahara is a staple of the definitive City Pop catalog today, and was very popular back in that day as well. Nakahara's established presence would change drastically in 1992, however, when she would never be seen publicly again. Nakahara Meiko has not been seen in 30 years. You heard that correctly, the year 2022 marks three full decades since her disappearance. And so, without further ado, let's look into the disappearance of Nakahara Meiko. Let's start at the beginning. Nakahara Meiko was actually born Kohara Akiko on May 8th of 1959. She was born in Yotsukaido Shi or Yotsukaido City located within Chiba Prefecture. Her family supposedly ran a fuel shop. Nakahara had a passion for songwriting since she was a child and began working on original music compositions in junior high school. It was at the age of 15 that Nakahara entered to perform on a music competition show. This was Kimi Koso Sutada, which translates to You Are the Star. This show ran from 1973 to 1980 and is very similar to the more well-known star Tanjo. Nakahara, unfortunately, did not receive enough points to proceed and win the competition. Nakahara's father was strongly against her pursuing a career in music and preferred that she attend college instead. This did not deter Nakahara, and honestly good for her for not giving up, that's incredibly admirable. And she later went on to study music at a school ran by singer Kunihiko Suzuki. Because Nakahara already had some experience in songwriting, she chose to focus on studies geared towards becoming a vocalist to broaden her skill set more so. At the age of 17, Nakahara began finding work as a backup vocalist. She saw success working on TV stations, but among her biggest breaks at the time was singing backup vocals for Hiromi Go, a 70s teen idol turned prominent musician who has an extensive and well-known discography in Japan. As Nakahara became older, her voice also began to achieve a more mature and husky sound. This shift led Nakahara to begin performing as a solo vocalist. It was in the early 80s at the Shinjuku Ruido K4, a well-known live house in Kabukicho Ward of Tokyo, where representatives at Toshiba EMI discovered her. 
Rewinding a little bit though, the Shinjuku Rido is a very well-known live house in a very cool spot. The late Yutaka Ozaki, a very well-known Japanese musician, actually debuted there in 1984. To my knowledge, it still exists and there's a few other locations throughout Tokyo. Back to 1982 though. Toshiba EMI took her under their wing and dubbed her the second Yumin. Yumin being the nickname of Matsutoya Yumi, a famous singer and songwriter who also has a very low and distinctive voice, much like Nakahara. It was after Nakahara's discovery that her very first single was released in 1982. This was when she was 22 years old. The single was called Konya Dake Dance Dance Dance. In the same year, her first album was also released. It was titled Coconut House. 1982 specifically was a very big year for Japanese pop music as the shift from more traditional sounds to something more modern became more apparent and mainstream. What other artists debuted in 1982? Well, to name a few, there's Matsumoto Iyo, Nakamori Akina, Hori Chiemi, and Hayami Yu. These were huge names at the time, particularly Akina who dominated the Oricon charts throughout the 1980s. Matsuda Seiko did too, of course, but she debuted back in 1980. From here, Nakahara continued to see success and growth as an artist. Her main demographic was meant to be girls in their late teens to early 20s, a demographic that the girl next door Showa idols of the time didn't entirely appeal to. This appeal was seen by Kanebo, a Japanese cosmetics company who took advantage of Nakahara's mature image. This cosmetics ad featured her song Kimi Tachi Kiwi Papaya Mango Dane. That's kind of fun to say. In Japan, this is the song that people best remember her for. The distinct Latin influence as well as the brass use make this song stand out quite a bit among the other songs at the time. At the time, it truly cemented her as a musical artist and made her a household name. And let's not forget her talent as a songwriter. Nakahara has written the majority of the songs she performs and even wrote music for Hayami Yu. This newfound fame made Nakahara very busy. Her schedule was often packed with new projects and she barely had any free time for herself. In 1985, one year after the Kanebo promotion, Nakahara performed the song Roro Roshian Ruretto. This song was used as the opening to the 1985 anime Dirty Pair. And let me tell you, this one is a certified hood classic, my friends. It slaps pretty dang hard and is probably my favorite song by her. Despite the fact that I can barely say it, because borrow words, I hate them. The song is the opening to the original 1985 Dirty Pair anime, not, not the one after that. She also sang Space Fantasy, the ending song for Dirty Pair. It's about two girls who fight crime in space and also has roots in Japanese female wrestling as it's what inspired the creator of Dirty Pair to create Dirty Pair. Completely unrelated, but a weird fact I wanted to share. It was also in 1985 that Nakahara released Meiko TV, a laser disc featuring 45 minutes of various music videos. Next came two songs for the anime Kimagure Orange Road. It's about a family of psychics, but focuses more on romantic love triangle teenager shenanigans. That being said, it's pretty good. The two songs are Kagami no Naka no Actress and Dance in the Memories. They were featured as the opening and ending theme songs for episodes 37 through 48. Dance in the Memories was also used in two episodes of the OVA. These mention promotions and theme songs aren't the only ones Nakahara created. Nakahara lended her voice to both dramas and commercial campaigns as well. This was the highest point in Nakahara's career. Between 1982 and 1988, she created 14 singles, 8 full albums, that laser disc I mentioned previously, and even a damn record, which is a special recording intended for use in a karaoke machine. It's speculated that, at this point, Nakahara's busy schedule began to take a toll on her. The years 1984 through 1988 were incredibly successful for her and she created a lot of great music during this time period. It was in 1988, however, that she would make a big decision that would drastically steer the direction of her life and career. Kagami no Naka no Actress was Nakahara's final album before a short hiatus. It was released on March 5th of 1988. Among the very few details surrounding Nakahara's personal life include her move to New York. The move is speculated to have occurred in 1988. This is according to this Japanese article I had found. 
Some articles list the year as 1990, but 1988 makes more sense considering her discography and this is when she took the break. Nakahana had visited America prior to 1988. This is seen in a picture taken in Chicago in 1984. But yeah, it's probably 1988 when Nakahata moved to New York. It is uncertain for how long she stayed there, though her 1990 album, 303 East 60th Street, features photographs taken in New York. 1990 is the year Nakahata actually returned from that first hiatus. This being considered, she could have been living in New York as she resumed her music career at this point in time. That Japanese article also claims Nakahara is back in Japan now, but this may not still be the case depending on when this interview actually took place. She may still be based in New York or may go back and forth, but this information is completely unknown. Between the years 1990 and 1992, Nakahara Meiko released a decent amount of new music. The 303 East 60th Street album and her 1991 album, On the Planet, Events of the Earth. She also released one more music video for the song, Distinguished Diamonds, Is It True Love? This song was used as the 1990 opening theme to a travel show that ran on TV Asahi at the time. When Nakahara was 32 years old, she would begin what would be her final tour. Well, some sources call it a tour, though her Japanese Wikipedia page lists it as a performance in the Nisin Power Station, which was a live house located in the basement of Nisin Foods. This company is known for their instant ramen. Not, not music. All joking aside though, it was a weird little juxtaposition. Honestly, sounded like a really cool spot, though I don't think they had an actual audience. They just recorded music from that location and broadcasted it. Still a cool spot nonetheless though. <laughs> now, to my knowledge from my own personal research, I don't believe this was labeled as a farewell show or made to landmark any kind of retirement from the industry. Though, basically, once the show ended, so did Nakahara's 10-year career as a vocalist. After this, Nakahara went radio silent, as far as any public activity goes, that is. Radio silent for the past 30 years. It is now 2022. At this point, Nakahara Meiko is currently 62 years old. Where Nakahara is and what she is currently doing remains completely unknown. I have, however, come across various details throughout the internet that suggest where she may be and what she's been doing all these years. Some of these come from decent sources, others are comments I've seen here and there around the internet that may not hold very much weight. Regardless, I'll present my findings here and now. Though, let's actually just pause for just a minute. Before I get into this, Nakahara Meiko's privacy is something that should be respected. I did not attempt to get in contact with anyone who may know her through private messages, like her relatives or friends and such, or previous co-workers, management, and I simply made use of information that has already been made available online. I think this is something that should already be inferred by everyone watching, but please do not contact people you believe she is associated with personally looking for more information. Anyways, moving on. So, where is she now? Well, we do know Nakahara has a history of songwriting. I mean, she did write much of her own music. Various sources have listed two specific artists that Nakahara has wrote music for. These two artists being Vivian Su and the girl group Chekiko. Vivian Su has been active since 1990 and remains active today. Nakahara wrote the song Hachigatsu no Valentine for Su. Chekiko was only active for a short time, that being 1998 to 1999. For this group, Nakahara wrote lyrics to the song Animaru-sama no Natsu Gakuru. Chekiko has returned for two short reunion shows in 2004 and 2009, however. Nakahara has written music for a number of artists over the years, though I have read around the internet that she has also written music under aliases. I have heard that she's written music for films as well, though I cannot confirm this as it's all hearsay. But anyways, web pages I have stumbled upon say she stopped writing music for Vivian Sue in the early 2000s. I'm not sure if this suggests that she stopped writing music entirely for people at this point or not. 
There is also a cover band that is dedicated to Nakahara's works. The most notable one is Loros, a tribute band named after one of Nakahara's albums. Among the members of Loros is a musician who goes by the name Megu. This member runs a personal blog online and it's within this blog that some of the most substantial information in recent years is provided. While the band Loros does have its own personal social media and blog dedicated to the band functions itself, the blog in particular, which has all the good stuff, is a line blog ran by Megu. It's her personal blog and has quite a few posts relating to Nakahara Meiko. Megu appears to be actively involved in looking for updates when it comes to how Nakahara is doing currently and will post new discoveries. I have also read on a Kaio Kyoku blog that this band actively searched for Nakahara in the late 2000s. One post in particular details how she recently came in contact with one of Nakahara's relatives who came out to see one of Lodos's shows. According to this relative, Nakahara is alive and well and currently residing in Tokyo. Beyond this, not a whole lot was shared by the relative, it seems. This was likely an effort to respect Nakahara's privacy, which is completely understandable. Though beyond this, there have been other updates. Upon researching, I was able to come into contact with people who run other blogs and engage in Facebook groups that update fans on Nakahara's whereabouts. It's within a Facebook group that I was able to come across yet another update. A very recent update from 2021. See, we've considered the possibility of Nakahara being in New York. We've seen comments stating she's back in Tokyo. But what if these are both incorrect? What if Nakahara is in neither of those places? What if Nakahara Meiko has moved back to Chiba Prefecture? See, this user apparently sent a private message to Loros last year. In this message, a member of Loros, I believe Megu, says that Nakahara is living happily in Chiba and that they are not currently involved in music in any way. The response also says to kind of take this with a grain of salt as this information was obtained from person to person and is simply what they've been told. It has not been confirmed by Nakahara herself. I've noticed some fans garnering somewhat of a romantic image of this possible outcome. Maybe Nakahara took over her family's fuel shop and she's living a happy and peaceful life back in her hometown. Really though, none of these have been proven to be true just yet. And I don't see any reason for any of these statements to be false. These blogs and community interactions provide the most substantial recent information available. If any of it proves to be true, then I feel that it's the news a lot of fans wanted to hear. After all, none of it is bad news. In conclusion, I think, while not something I can confidently confirm, Nakahara Meiko is likely alive and well. Her work in the industry is all done behind the scenes following her departure from the public eye in 1992. Looking at how the busy lifestyle of a singer took a toll on her in the mid-80s and how she came back to create music publicly after that 1988 hiatus, only to retire completely, I think it's safe to conclude that she left the public eye simply because it was just too much. Being in the public eye like that and working yourself to the point of exhaustion can no doubt take a toll on one's mental health, even physical health. If this was the case for Nakahara, then I greatly respect her decision to leave the public eye. It's admirable and I hope she found more happiness and a more fulfilling career in the years following 1992. Will we see a public appearance from Nakahara again in the future? Well, that's entirely up to Nakahara to decide. It's completely up to what she feels comfortable doing. Her record label is still Toshiba EMI and re-releases and compilations of her music have been released in recent years through them. This includes four different best of albums. The last seeing a release in 2005. This information does not say a whole lot about any new projects, however, simply that she has the same record label still. If Nakahara Meiko did happen to be watching this video, I'd tell her this. Nakahara Meiko-san no ongaku no fan ni natte kara 10 nen hodo tachimasu. Nakahara-san no ongaku ni wa teenager no muzukashi jiki ni tasugete itadakimashita. Nakahara Meiko-san no ongaku ni wa kokoro kara kansha shiteimasu. 
。本当にありがとうございました。I recall buying a compilation CD of hers on Amazon when I was about 17 years old. I still have it actually. When I was just learning to drive in my first car, a crappy 2001 Chevy Malibu, I would listen to that CD for hours. It was quite literally the soundtrack to that time in my life as I practiced driving for hours on end in preparation for taking my driving exam. Nakahara's music has a special place in my heart for that reason. So, what about you guys? What city pop artist really s t r i k e a chord with you? Who is your favorite artist and what is your favorite city pop track? Why do you like them? What draws you to them? Please let me know in the comments, I'd really love to hear from you. As for myself, I'm pretty partial to Bay City and Shyness Boy myself. I also love literally everything that Tatsuro Yamashita creates. Also, After Five Clash has the most aesthetic album cover I have ever seen, and I want nothing more than to obtain one of the vinyl records for my personal collection. I mean, just look at him. Look at this dude. What a king. Anyways, that is all for today. I look forward to seeing you all in the next video, and I really hope you enjoyed this little deep dive research thing of mine. Anyways, bye for now! While I'm not an expert in rap music by any means, Japan's history with the music genre goes almost as far back as it does in America. While rap music dates back to the 1970s in the United States, it's the early 1980s when it was brought to Japan. This was supposedly by Toshio Nakanishi or Hiroshi Fujiwara, or maybe both simultaneously, that's really up for debate. Anyways, J rap or Japanese hip hop or Japanese rap began to flourish in underground scenes and take on a unique identity. It was in the year 1997 when J rap was in full swing and a mysterious rapper entered the scene. The rapper was known as Nipponia Nippon, or at least that was their stage name. What else do we know about Nipponia Nippon? Well, nothing. This artist produced two tracks on one single, both made available on this record, which is a very limited underground release. The tracks themselves are fire, but the lyrics themselves are very cryptic and have led many to speculate if there's any deeper meaning behind them. There's a great deal of mystery surrounding this record, so much mystery in fact that it's become a somewhat popular internet mystery on the Japanese internet. Specifically, Futaba Channel or Nichan or Tuchan, I really gotta figure out a name to continue calling this webpage. For years, people have attempted to find out more information on the mysterious artist behind this record, from the details of the recording and the tracks themselves to the current whereabouts of the artists and if they are even still among the living. The mystery behind this talented artist, someone with a very brief and short lived career, if you could even call it that, is what we will be exploring today. So, let's go ahead and explore the mystery of Nipponia Nippon. The most mysterious rapper of Japan. Nipponia Nippon was a rapper that released one self titled album in 1997. There are two known formats for this record, the more common being the LP EP release, and the other one being a CD release, which I personally cannot find any photographs of online. The more rare of the two releases is definitely that CD release. Though it is worth noting that both of these releases are pretty hard to come by, and that's understandable considering the underground scene of the time, as well as we don't really. Really、know how many of these records were produced and sold. As I mentioned in my introduction, the J rap scene of Japan gathered its own identity from how hip hop and rap music was seen in the rest of the world. It is, in my opinion, that Japanese culture can have the tendency to add a sense of melancholy into its music, regardless of if a certain genre originated from another country and holds a different cultural significance there. And what about this underground scene? What was it like? Well, according to my own personal research, it wasn't a very happy place. It was pretty bleak. 
distressing even. Japanese hip-hop is a prominent example of this, in my opinion, as the underground J-rap scene of the late 90s was filled with a lot of dark themes and music that was somewhat of an outlet to those who made use of those dark themes. It was an experience shared on one of the 2chan posts that I found discussing Nippon Yo Nippon that stuck with me a lot regarding this. A poster recalled purchasing an album of an underground rapper in the late 1990s. This album included a link to a webpage, or to my knowledge, some way to access a specific webpage. The webpage ended up containing the suicide letter of the rapper on that album. It is also worth noting that, unlike the Akiba tape, this song was available online in some form of another since its release. This is something I cannot definitively confirm, though this did have a release in the late 90s and the internet was kind of picking up speed and gaining traction at this point, so I do find this believable. But, regardless of this, the mystery and intrigue of this record did not come about with its initial upload and release. Rather, it came about much later. And by much later, I mean as early as 2008 and then later on in 2011 and 2013. At least, these are the most prominent examples of posts and discussion regarding Nippon and Nippon that I can find. It may be a more broader and far-reaching understanding of the J-Rap scene online, where Nipponia and Nippon eventually gained traction and their music was recognized and discussed. This was unfortunately much after the fact, when Nipponia and Nippon was no longer a new name on the scene, and now just another rapper that went under the radar. So, let's go ahead and get the ball rolling here and get back to the record in question. This was a record that went under the radar, as I said, and was only sold for 100 yen when it was initially released in that underground scene. Keep in mind, this is only about a dollar in US dollars. Actually, a little less than that. This record has a really interesting background that adds to the elusiveness of the rapper themselves, the music, and the overall mystery. So, let's go ahead and explore that, shall we? So the record is technically an EP. The first track is an instrumental introduction. It's about a minute and a half in length and features no lyrics. Though, honestly, it is a vibe. Then we have the next track being one of only two tracks with actual lyrics in them. This track is called Yogore Tachi, which translates to bad blood or dirty blood. Let me just quickly preface this by saying that J-Rap lyrics are among the most difficult things in general that I have ever tried to interpret in Japanese. They're very cryptic, a lot of play on words that I've never heard before, and I have asked for multiple people's opinions on this just to make sure what I'm reading is as confusing as I think it is, which to other people it is, yes. But to my knowledge, this song has a lot of themes of self-hatred as well as blood being contaminated or unclean. There is also some kind of hatred towards what I believe to be the medical system or doctors. The only way for me to accurately depict the subject matter is to just read a translation of the lyrics, so I'll go ahead and provide some of that. Sick blood that started to become neglected over time. They keep coming one after another. More masks looking to profit. Facing a drawing of blood that remains unsolved. The injection needle pushed into the scar in the arm. The reflection of a bleak face in the back window. Next track, the second of the two with actual lyrics, is Namake Mono, which translates to pretty much a lazy person or somebody who is lazy. So this one is equally dark and equally cryptic. It does involve the struggles of someone not being useful or helpful to society and wanting to change that, but can't become helpful because of the general stigma of being lazy. At least that's how I interpreted the lyrics. I personally feel like this one may be an allegory for depression. While the meaning isn't confirmed, it's definitely bleak and desperate in its subject matter. Here's some of the lyrics. I want to get out of here already. A lazy person who dozed off at the root of the sun. I want to strongly take a step forward. At the start, I'll light my zippo and bury the controversy. 
I want to strongly take a step forward. Every time, I shamefully do nothing and end up right where I started. Following this are technically two more tracks, one being an instrumental version of Yogore Tachi, and the next one being an outro that is also instrumental. While there is only two tracks with lyrics on this album, there's... there's definitely a lot to unpack here, and honestly, following the subject matter of these two tracks with vocals, the outro almost feels unsettling and anxious. It's definitely something that makes you feel emotions that aren't exactly happy, and I have a hunch that is what the artist intended. Aside from the lyrics, we also have information provided on the album EP record itself. Here are some images of the vinyl release. Due to its small distribution, it doesn't have full cover art, instead it simply includes a little sheet with the information that one would typically associate with something on an album cover. Anyways, the record itself has this same information printed onto it. We've already went through the tracks, and the year of release was already established earlier in the video, but there are two other pieces of information that are provided. Information that reads, 1997 Vibe Music and Produced by Far. Vibe Music is actually a fairly well-known hip-hop record label. Not incredibly well-known, unlike their parent label, Ultra Vibe, but they do have an extensive catalog of releases and are still around today, their latest release being in 2020. Vibe Music was established in 1995, and this was only two years before Nippon and Nippon's album was released. With that considered, Vibe Music definitely wasn't as established as they are today. They were very much a new name, and likely worked with a lot of new names in the scene, and not more prominent musical artists. The producer of this record, named here as Far, can easily be found online when looking into the album on Discogs. He's worked on a significant amount of projects from a variety of different genres and record labels. It's also interesting to note that his music credits began around 1997 to 1998 at the very least. That's how far back his credits go on Discogs. And again, with that release of the Nippon Nippon EP in 1997, this was a very early work of FARS. As far as I can tell, the pun not intended, FAR slash com began working in the industry around 1997 and 1998, and this is according to Discogs. So, working with Nippon Nippon was a very early project of theirs. It could even be the earliest. Another big detail to note is that FAR no longer goes by FAR. The name this producer goes under most of the time is actually Calm. His other aliases include Organ Language and his actual name, to, to my knowledge, that being Kyotaka Fukagawa. Far slash Calm is still active today, we'll get into that more in a second actually. At this point, it's also worth noting that the catalog number is also featured on the record. This is important information, but not very important when considering that this album is not lost. See, if the song was lost or the song was unidentified and we didn't know the name of the artist at all, then this would be pretty important. Though, with this specific internet mystery, the catalog number is not that big a deal. While the search for this artist has technically been ongoing for about 10 years, 10 to 12 years, it's not really that much of a search. This is unfortunately similar to the case of the Akiba tape and the search efforts in Japan, as there's more discussion regarding it and not much actual efforts in locating and finding what happened to this person. Really, everything provided online, or at least the majority of everything provided online, that did that make sense? I don't know. Theories and discussion have taken place on 2chan threads. This popular one from 2011, as well as another from a little later in 2013. 
They're pretty long, but various discussion and theories have come about from them. Here's some theories that have come into play. It is equally possible that Nipponi and Nippon just gave up on their music career and decided to go about living as a normal person with a normal 9 to 5 job. The lyrics of Nipponi's tracks do suggest that he may have been homeless. This is not confirmed much like anything else on the record, it's just all lyrics that are suggestive, but it is a theory that many have considered. Another pretty dark theory developed by listeners is that Nipponia Nippon was possibly suffering from AIDS or Hepatitis B. This is primarily from the lyrics of the track Dirty Blood and also just empty speculation. There are, however, more positive ideas thrown around, however. Maybe Nipponia Nippon is still around and creating music. Maybe he just goes by a different name. The voice element is the reason why two rappers are suggested to be Nippon and Nippon, possibly, today. These rappers are Kimi Dori and Kurobi. These come from the 2chan threads and are mainly suggested because they sound similar to Nippon and Nippon. And really, the vocals are all we have to work off of. Again, these are all just theories. These are just comments and speculation by random commenters on image threads and blog posts. There's nothing substantial and nothing concrete that can really tell us what happened to Nippon and Nippon and where they are today. But next, we can get into what we know actually probably did happen. There are a few different blog posts that come up when trying to search up on this rapper. Most posts just kind of summarize the mystery or review the music itself, but there is one specific blog that went beyond this a little bit. This brings us back to Calm or Far, the producer of the Nipponia Nippon EP. This blog, written by a Tokyo native user named Hagakure way back in 2008, details the writer's attempts at learning new info about Nipponia Nippon, specifically if Nipponia Nippon would be available to perform live. They were unable to find any information on the rapper online, so ultimately attempted to contact Far through his official webpage, and they were successful. Far did end up getting back to this blog writer, stating that there was no possibility of a live show happening at least through Far slash Calm themselves accommodating it. Far would then go on to share a detail that both clarified and added mystery to this artist. See, apparently, during the recording of Dirty Blood, Nippon and Nippon disappeared. They left without any warning and Far simply never heard from them again. The record was ultimately released following Nipponia's disappearance. Far also shared one other detail, and it's a little cryptic. That being the statement that is translated to roughly, the payment never being received. Now, I gotta be honest with you guys, I am a little confused as to what payment directly translates to. I don't really have the ability with my personal Japanese ability to tell you what it means, though it is pretty vague um, to other people I've asked. But there are one of two outcomes uh, as to what may have happened in regards to payment and what this could be suggested. Nipponia did not pay far some kind of fee that was owed, or Nipponia did not receive any payment or royalties for his work on the LP as nobody was able to reach him following his sudden absence. 
Of course, the latter is more likely, though it's not 100% clear, so yeah. One theory I had personally regarding this EP is maybe there is some lost media involving it. That being a lost unreleased track, an unfinished track because of Nipponia's departure, or possibly some recording of a live performance that had taken place in the late 90s before the artist's departure. Though there is absolutely no proof that any lost media surrounding this album exists, let me just make that clear. As far as we know, no such recordings or footage exists. Since we don't know what the artist actually looks like, we don't really have much to go off of. We don't know their actual name or anything about them as a person. All we really do have is what they sound like and the dark subject matter of their music as well as their musical style. So, in recent years, there haven't been any new developments or any new groundbreaking details in the search for Nipponia Nippon. That one blog post did reveal a little bit of information regarding the person's whereabouts and the fact that they just, you know, kind of dipped. But other than that, there's been nothing in recent years. No concrete info, but many are firm on the idea of suicide. This is not confirmed, let me just be clear here, but a lot of the information that is available to us does point to a more grim outcome. Now granted, we barely have any information at all. Basically, just the dark subject matter of his music and the information given by far slash calm in that blog post. Hopefully, this is not the case. Honestly, I'm not sure if this mystery will ever be resolved. There's a lot of speculation that goes with it, but very little to work with and come to a legitimate conclusion with. Again, I'm not an expert with hip-hop or rap, but I can tell that a lot of emotion went into the writing of this music. It is very clear that this artist has talent and potential. It has now, however, been 25 years since the release of this LP, and the Nipponia Nippon of today may be a vastly different person than what he was and remembered as from his music. He may be the same passionate musician who just makes music under a different name or with different subject matter. Maybe he just doesn't want to be associated with the name Nipponia Nippon anymore. Regardless of what the reason is, I just hope he's doing well. Anyways, that is all I have for you guys today. I do have a few quick shoutouts though. Firstly, to the Twitter user Reindex. They're actually the person who uploaded the Akiba tape to YouTube and brought this mystery of Nipponia Nippon to my attention, so thank you. I also want to thank Kai Translations on Twitter as they helped me a ton when it came to kind of figuring out what the 2chan threads were saying and some blog posts. And also huge shout out to Matt vs. Japan for helping me out with the lyrics a ton. Um, I was very, very confused by a lot of the use of words in them and he clarified a lot and helped me equally as much as the other people who helped me with clarifying the Japanese. So again, thank you very, very much. Also, thank you to anyone and everyone who watched part one of my Do Not Search Iceberg. I do have part two coming out really soon, so please guys be patient with me. I know you really want to see it. I just want to make sure it's ready and a good video and you know, all that junk. I'm working as fast as I can on it, so please, you know, be patient. It'll, it'll be out soon, I promise. Anyways, that is all I have for today. I hope you guys like this little mystery. Hopefully this dude is doing well. And yeah, that's about it. Really hope for nothing but the best for Nipponia Nippon. Anyways, guys, I'll see you in the next video. And yeah, that's it. Bye, guys. begins in the early 1990s, in a thrift store in Akihabara, which is located within Tokyo. It was here that an unmarked cassette tape was purchased for only 50 yen at a thrift store located within the iconic Radio Kaikon building. 
This tape was supposedly found in a box by the entrance of said thrift store. A box with too many cassette tapes to even begin to count. It was a store the purchaser had visited many times in the past. This person, who had often visited Akihabara by bicycle with some friends, returns home and listens to this tape, along with a few others that they had purchased that day. A common similarity with these tapes is that they were initially blank and recorded onto, much like how you would record onto a VHS tape television programming. Upon beginning to listen to said tapes, not much is noteworthy, and many of these cassette tapes have some kind of description written on them, likely containing titles of the songs or or just a general idea of what to expect once you pop in the cassette tape and listen to it. There was one, however, that did not have any title. Only something that was scribbled out on part of the label and is now unable to be read. All of the songs the purchaser had listed prior to this are easily recognized until a certain song begins to play. A song with no title, but ominous and almost eerie lyrics. A song that would set forth one of Japan's most notable internet mysteries and urban legends. One that one could say is just as notorious as Hitogata. This is a mystery that spans decades and still remains unsolved. This is the mystery of Akihabara de Kata Kaseto Tepu no Kyoku. But for this video, I'm going to dub it the most mysterious song of Japan. to be some mistakes. I mean, I'd be pretty surprised if there weren't. I did put a full effort in trying to piece this video together and put a great deal of time into making sure it's coherent and professional and just generally reputable. So if there is any issues or anything that's not correct, please do not hesitate to let me know. I will pin it in a comment or put it in my description, probably both. And I do have to say, this was not my sole efforts alone. I do have to credit my Japanese instructor, uh, Tompkinsu Sensei. If you are watching this, thank you so, so much for helping me out. I, I'm eternally grateful. So, it all started in the year 2000. This is when the original poster uploaded the track to Tuchan, along with some background info on the song. The OP, as we'll refer to them as for the rest of this video, asks for info on a board specializing in occult content. And why there, you may be asking? Well, to begin, there is a very long history with the song of it being possibly cursed and just generally creepy. Though, back in 2000, it didn't really have the notoriety as it does today on the Japanese internets. It does have some pretty ominous lyrics, and the way it was found is also rather creepy. This 2000 thread didn't actually begin with the OP. Rather, there was a user unrelated to the OP asking for songs to listen to while they looked at creepy content online. 
This likely included urban legends, creepypastas, and just general stuff like that. There's this poster specified that they wanted songs that weren't intentionally creepy. Nothing that would have a quote-unquote ghost voice intended to scare people, but just something that would be generally unsettling. Among the responses on this forum was the person, the OP, who had found the 50N cassette tape. They went on to comment that they had posted the song elsewhere in the past, and, and most people described it as sounding scary. A little more information was provided on why the OP purchased this cassette tape, as they went on to write that this cassette tape had no markings other than that little scribbled out portion. Even more information was provided, as the tape itself was described as being a blank cassette tape that could record up to 20 minutes of audio. They also added that the mysterious song of, of Japan was not the only song on the tape, as they went on to say that the tape included a song by Takahashi Yumiko. Takahashi is an idol who was popular around the early 90s and actually debuted in the year 1990. The OP claimed that they recognized every song on the tape and the other tapes they had purchased, except for that one mysterious song. I do want to clarify that this is actually not the cassette tape in question, as it's just used as an example by the OP. So, long story short, we have actually never seen an official photo of the original cassette tape. Following the OP's description, as well as sharing a very low-quality variant of the song itself, remember, it's the year 2000, there were a few comments commenting on how scary the song sounded. One specific post- that the quote-unquote scariness was due to the low quality of the upload. Though, despite this, this very same poster went on to comment on how eerie the lyrics were and how off-putting the vocals sounded. Specifically, how off-putting the pitch becomes of the vocalist halfway through the track. They do conclude the post as defining it as cursed. And while people did comment on the spookiness of this song very early on, this was merely the beginning of the recognition and, again, notoriety the song would receive. Said notoriety only grew once the audio was uploaded to Nico Nico Doga in 2007. It was in this year that the song was uploaded with the title, So Eerie, the song on the cassette tape I bought in Akihabara. The original description of this upload, while in Japanese, translates to this. Thank you again, Sensei. <laughs> I used to visit Akihabara frequently over 10 years ago. Back then, there was this store that used to sell cassette tapes for only 50 yen. This was one of the songs I had found on one of those cassette tapes. I welcome all comments and thoughts on this somewhat eerie song. The description does go on to also explain some technical issues relating to the upload of the song itself. It explains that the length on the upload is not the song's actual full length. The software the OP had at the time could only create videos in one minute increments and the song was about three and a half minutes in length. Because of that, the video cuts off and fades out at a weird time, before the video fades out. This is where one of the urban legends comes in, though cannot be confirmed as this original upload no longer exists on Nico Nico. Apparently, according to some comments from the era, the upload initially didn't sync and progress correctly with the timeline that showed the video duration. So, according to hearsay around the web, the track time on the bar would begin to mismatch with the song and how the song was progressing on that timeline. 
there currently exist uploads on Nico Nico as well as YouTube, and neither actually do this in case anyone is curious. Following this upload, this song and this video of the song soon became a part of various tags and categories on Nico Nico. Among these is the seven mysteries of Nico Nico. While I won't go into too much detail here, it is something or rather certain elements of the seven mysteries are things I do want to talk about later. Another tag used is the tell me the name of the song tag on Nico Nico. A tag that at this point in time has over 580 songs connected to it. Basically, think the tip of my tongue subreddit, but in video form. Now, here are also some creepier categories the song belongs to. First, we have the words Nico Nico Danger Zone, which is often attached to uploads of this song. Comments by viewers of the videos also write these words in the comments. Another category associated with the Akiba tape, or most mysterious song of Japan, are words you should never search. These words being Akihabara de Kata Koseto Tepu no Kyoku. So, is the song that creepy? The whole lost media element is, and and, of course, so is the way it was found, and not recognizable by anyone. This goes for a lot of lost media out there, but it does beg the question, is the song itself really that creepy? The lyrics themselves, I must admit, are a little unsettling, but I wouldn't say blatantly so. The lyrics are also the reason why that kind of desolate forest image shows up on a lot of these uploads. So, what is the song about? What are the lyrics? Where are you going? Chasing after the wind. Dead leaves the color of the setting sun. Knock on the door. Sleep in a broken chair. The light glowing outside the window. Dream of an unknown town. Goodbye to you. With a sad smile. Fly away to a distant country. Ah, there are the stars. Spanning the departing sky. Touch the bluebird's wings gently with your finger before setting it free. So, in my humble opinion, I don't feel it's directly creepy. As a matter of fact, these lyrics are a lot easier to make out than the original Lost Song's lyrics, meaning the most mysterious song on the internet. Really, my own initial impressions were that it sounds like a solemn, melancholy breakup song, as though the vocalist is leaving her lover and not looking back. And there is really a lot of melancholy Japanese music out there. Would the song be as creepy if it was well known by the Japanese populace? I would honestly love to hear what you guys think about that, so let me know in the comments if you have any thoughts. Moving on, there's this thing on the Japanese internet called the Nico Nico Encyclopedia. It's basically an online encyclopedia slash online forum that was launched in 2008. This webpage is another big element of the Akiba tape's existence on the internet. A dedicated search for the song had actually taken place on this platform, with people suggesting various artists and songs. A great deal of them, actually. Really, there have been a plethora of ideas as to who could have sang this song since it was introduced onto the internet. There is one prominent potential title and artist that was in the forefront of this search for quite some time, one that only grew in credibility. With that said, allow me to introduce you to another piece of Japanese lost media. 
Yui Saito's Midnight Sympathy, a single from 1989. At the point in time where it was considered in the search, neither the lyrics or the song itself existed online and it was completely lost. Yui Saito herself is not known as a singer though, and is actually well known in other forms of media in the late 80s. Specifically, adult films in the late 80s. Midnight Sympathy was her very first and only single. So why was Midnight Sympathy such a popular suggestion by so many? From what I can personally conclude based on my own research, it's the time period Midnight Sympathy was produced and the fact that it was also lost. Perhaps some people felt that Midnight Sympathy and the Akiba tape were pieces of the same puzzle that just weren't connected just yet. Well, the single was eventually found, recovered, and made available online. So, is the song on the tape? Is the song Midnight Sympathy by Yui Saito? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Things did begin to point in this direction before the find of the single itself, however, as the song duration of Midnight Sympathy is different from the duration of the upload of the mysterious song, though the exact duration of the mysterious song of Japan is still unconfirmed due to the upload mishaps. I mean, it might be off by a couple of seconds, but still we don't have the definitive, confirmed actual duration of the song. Regardless, long story short, the mysterious song of Japan ended up not being Midnight Sympathy after all. And the single Midnight Sympathy itself is fairly rare as it's unavailable through various stores that have it listed on their sites. This includes Amazon, Disc Union, and Discogs. It is not completely unfindable at this point, however, as I did see a few currently for sale on sites like Mercari, and they're not expensive. They really range anywhere from 3,500 yen to 5,500, which is about 35 to 55 dollars. So what about those other suggestions? Nico Nicopedia users had also suggested artists such as Cave, or possibly an early work of Audi Project, which is a rock band that became active back in 1984. Some feel the lyrics and sound of the mysterious song of Japan are similar to their early works, and I can definitely see it personally. I've even seen some suggestions like Zard, or even an early demo from a 90s idol like Ayumi Hamazaki. Really, a lot of names have been suggested and considered, though it's completely unknown if any of these suggestions really hold any weight. A lot of them are pretty out there, a lot of them do make sense. Among the suggestions I've read, one that does make sense is Yukiko Okada. Okada was an idol active for a short period of time during the Showa era, from her official debut in 1984 to her death in 1986. Though, with the other known song on the Akiba tape being a track from no earlier than 1990, this could be unlikely. Though, there are things that did stand out to me personally when I heard the mysterious song myself. To begin, it does sound a bit like her. One of the comments on the 2chan board, the original one, did say the pitch of the song was a little weird halfway through. And honestly, Yukiko Okada's voice kind of had a similar, odd pitch if you do listen to her songs. Okada did have a lot of solemn songs that have similar lyrics to the mysterious song. She also had unreleased content due to her death. One confirmed instance is Hana no Image, a 1986 single. The release of the single was cancelled due to her death, and while the song did actually air one single time 
on Okada's radio show one day before her death. An official release did not occur until 13 years later in 1999. With all of that considered, it could be possible that Yukiko Okada had recorded other tracks that didn't make the cut for an album or were just left unreleased. Okada's production company, Sun Music, is also very close to Akihabara. Is it possible? Yes. Is it likely? Not really. Another possible and very likely conclusion to the search is that it's from an idol that just never made it big. There were a lot of idols in Japan during this time. Well, the demand and popularity of idols really peaked during the late Showa era, many of these idols likely debuted, received little recognition or positive reception, and faded into obscurity. Especially as the popularity of idols decreased during the 1990s. The vocalist of the mysterious song of Japan could be an idol who had no management or very little management and only existed locally in a somewhat underground scene. Now, brief disclaimer here, I don't know anything about music theory or composition. The instrumentals sound somewhat professional to me, but that may not be the case. This recording could have been made with less resources than a big record label provide. But again, I really have no idea. I mean, A Fever You Can't Sweat Out was an album that was made on a budget, yet became extremely popular overnight. This is something I never knew until recently, and I really can't tell from listening to any of the early Panic music itself. But again, if you're big on music theory and have a good ear, let me know what you think. I really have no idea. Anyways, back to my point. <laughs> and yeah, if you've noticed that I'm specifically saying idol right now, that's because I haven't even gotten into the possibility of it belonging to a band or some kind of solo vocalist that didn't fit that idol image. While the song definitely gives me an idol vibe, and another idol song was on the tape, that doesn't exactly conclude that the vocalist was an idol. There were quite a few groups at this time, the early 90s and late 80s, that were categorized as musical groups or bands that had a female vocalist. Dreams Come True, Zabadok, TRF, and Lindbergh are just a few I can name off the top of my head. These are all artists that were popular during the late 80s and early 90s. And yeah, that does broaden things quite a bit. So the OP never uploaded the full contents of the cassette tape. While they may have not thought of the rest of the tape as noteworthy or containing of any clues, it could hold some kind of lead. You'd you'd be surprised what the lost media community can dig up sometimes. One small clue that I could find was the thrift store itself. While unnamed, it was located in a building called Radio Kaikan, which translates to Radio Hall. If you've ever been to Akihabara, you've likely seen this guy. It was rebuilt in 2011 and remains in the same spot today. While knowing this location isn't a huge clue, it might help out a little bit. There may be some way to track down the original thrift store, though I'm sure a lot of businesses come in and out of that specific building. So, over the years, there have been quite a few leads, though unfortunately none have been really significant just yet. Hopefully that will change in the future. There was, however, a huge milestone in the search. In 2011, a very surprising upload provided what could potentially be critical information to the search. During this year, a video was uploaded to Nico Nico, a video titled Dead Leaves of Sorrow, Something Lost in the Forest. The contents of this video? a high-quality stereo recording of the mysterious song. 
the original upload of the song, that one from 2007 and the one from 2000, were both in mono, and this upload sounded significantly better. Word of this upload spread to Nico Nicopedia forums, and the OP was ecstatic. So much so that they changed the name of the 2007 upload of the song to something along the lines of, I'm glad I finally found the title. Though, the discovery did not remain valid for long, as it was later discovered that this stereo recording was actually an enhanced version of the original mono audio. After this, the OP actually deleted that original 2007 video. In addition, the OP later clarified that while the original upload of the song was in mono, the recording on the cassette tape itself was recorded in stereo, meaning that the recording of the Akiba tape was already in stereo to begin with. This was nothing new. And for a long time, this was thought to be where the search ended. There were no leads and nobody really knew if the song would ever be identified. At that point, the Akiba tape just became the source of urban legends and just was mainly known as a cursed song that people should avoid. It wasn't until 2018 that genuine search efforts resumed. It was in this year that the OP uploaded a newer, higher quality rip of the song. In the description, the OP goes on to express that they're still highly interested in finding information on the song, as well as providing more details about finding it. After all these years, after these decades have passed, they still have hope. They describe the appearance of the tape, noting the black marker on it in that reference image from earlier. They also clarify that the song was always in stereo and explain the backstory of how and when they acquired it. There are also some interesting new details provided that could help the search along. Here is a brief translation of these new details. There are multiple stores in a building near Akihabara Station, one of which specializes in cassette tapes, VHS tapes, floppy disks, etc. There was a large cardboard box near the entrance with a lot of used cassette tapes in it. And this is one of those tapes. They were sold for 50 yen each. So, things we pretty much already knew, but here's where it gets really interesting. In this used cassette corner, there were lots of what seemed to be samples of songs from before they were released. Songs used in commercials, demo tapes, etc from the recording industry. Some of these tapes had the names of record companies on them. This tape didn't have anything written on it. So, understanding the origin of the other cassettes in the box could provide some clarity on what this tape was and where it came from. I personally wonder if the other available tapes came from a variety of different record companies, or if the tapes in this box primarily came from one record company. This info was not provided, though it could just be assumed that there was a variety. Let's look again at the other song that was on the Akiba tape, however. The track by Yumiko Takahashi. Upon doing a brief search on Discogs, I found that all of her albums have been released under the album label Victor. Could Victor be the label that owns the rights to this mysterious song? Or were these separate tracks recorded on separate occasions by different companies and different people? Keep in mind that these cassette tapes are not the masters. They were something that came from a much higher quality source. There's potential for speculation here, but we still have a lot of questions and no answers. As of right now, the latest article on the Akihabara cassette tape was in 2020. And at that point, no new information has been discovered. It has been noted that there are now search efforts on Reddit as well, as a note at the end of the article by the 
person who wrote it after the fact, though I've been unable to find any posts on Reddit regarding this song. Granted, I really haven't done much digging just yet. As of me sitting here making this video for all my lovely viewers listening and watching right now, in the year 2021, there is no English information available on this mystery, and again, I really, really, really have my Japanese instructor to thank when it comes to putting this together. And I honestly wouldn't have a video without her, so again, thank you so much. Really, it is my hope that this mystery can be introduced to a new audience and fresh eyes and ears, and maybe this song can, at long last, be identified and credited to its creators. I know there's a lot of really talented, bright, and very clever people out there on the internet that might be able to find something. And of course, links will be provided in the description if you want to hear the full song or Midnight Sympathy if you think either of them are, you know, certified bops. Just, you know, keep in mind that these words are, you know, words you should never search due to them being, you know, cursed and all. See you in the next video. Ah yes, the Akihabara tape, also known as Fly Away or the most mysterious song of Japan. And while there are many mysterious unidentified songs out there, unidentified songs themselves have gained newfound attention in recent years. The song on the cassette tape I found in Akihabara, as this mystery is known in Japan, has been the topic of both speculation and unease for decades. The song and the mystery behind it was introduced in Japan way back in the year 2000, which, you know, is 23 years ago now. Yikes. For those unfamiliar with the mystery, allow me to give you a brief rundown. So, Tokyo in 1990, or approximately 1990. Around this time period, in Akihabara, the electronics district of Tokyo, there was a thrift store that specialized in electronic goods. Said store existed within the Radio Kaikon building, which is a very famous building in Japan but was refurbished over a decade ago and the original one no longer exists. At the front of said store, there was a box full of cassette tapes, and a lot of them, many of which were previously blank and recorded over. A student who frequently rode his bicycle to Akiba with his friends found some cassette tapes within this box, purchased them for only 50 yen, that being a little less than 50 cents, and took them home. Upon going through the contents of these tapes, it was found that most of the songs were easily recognizable. Except for one. This song was perceived by the listener as both mysterious and ominous. It made such an impact, in fact, that they later uploaded it to Tuchan to see if anyone recognized the song. This first post came about in the year 2000, about 10 years after they acquired the tape. And nobody recognized the song. Something that was primarily taken note of rather than identifying the song was how creepy it sounded. Because of this, it became what's defined as an unsearchable term in Japan, as well as one of the mysteries of Nico Nico, which it was later uploaded to in 2007. The song remained unidentified, and though there were some theories thrown around about who sung the song, particularly Adi Project or the vocalist from Adi Project, there was never really a dedicated search in itself, at least in Japan. In the time since I first discussed this mystery, well over a year ago, an abundance of interest and search efforts have came about. This includes actual substantial developments. So, let's pick up where we left off, shall we? So, like I said, search efforts in Japan actually occurred, though seemed to be at a complete halt by 2021. I mean, by this point in time, the Akihabara tape mystery was kind of an old internet relic. The most recent significant discussion on this topic occurred around the late 2000s at this point. 
However, shortly after my upload, re-uploads of the song itself with an English title came about. It surprised me even further when restorations of the song came about as well. Shortly following this, a very detailed and dedicated Reddit post on r slash lostwave courtesy of user iamps85 was posted. A user who has also uploaded song restorations. This Reddit post was posted at the beginning of 2022, and to be clear, the Akiba tape song had been mentioned on the specific subreddit in the past, being referred to as Fly Away, though was not discussed at great lengths until iamps85's post, a post I consider highly influential to the events that followed. It was here, my friends, where the true search for the origin of the Akiba tape's mysterious song began. It was following this post that the creation of the song's very own subreddit came about, r slash Japan's mystery song. And shortly following this came the song's first significant discovery. That the song was made sometime after the year 1984. How was this narrowed down though? By the first prominent Reddit post within the official subreddit. And this brings us to the instruments used within the song itself and the discovery of which ones were used. To those familiar with music composition and instruments themselves, two things may have become apparent upon hearing this track. One, the instruments used are all electronically generated through a musical instrument digital interface, or MIDI, rather than from organic instruments played live in a studio. Most come from a synthesizer. And two, because of this composition, the track was likely an amateur project or a demo produced for a larger company. We'll get into that shortly. It was in that aforementioned and significant Reddit post that the drum machine in the song used to create, you know, all those drum noises, was identified. And what was the drum machine? Well, it was... <clears throat> drum roll. The Yamaha RX-11, a professional drum machine initially released in Japan in July of 1984. This find came courtesy of Reddit user Hornes69, who had been restoring that specific drum machine. They were, later on, able to provide a demonstration with the RX-11 in their possession. Another key detail, one that is all but confirmed, is the synthesizer used for the track. Upon inspection, it's highly likely that the Yamaha DX7 was the synth used to produce the other MIDI sounds in the song. This in itself is not as big a key detail though. The DX7 was among the most commonly used synthesizers of the time and was produced from May of 1983 to 1989. However, it is noteworthy that the SY77 was a Yamaha synthesizer that replaced the DX7 in December of 1989. Now, why exactly is the synth believed to be the DX7 specifically? Hornas69 states that they recognize various sounds unique and exclusive to the DX7, one specifically being the Koto patch featured in the synth's ROM1 cartridge. Narrowing down the instruments was only the first phase, the beginning even, in better understanding this track. In the early days of this search, there was one task that remained among the top priorities in understanding the track better. That task being contacting the original poster who had purchased that cassette tape in 1990 and later uploaded information in the track itself in 2000. Now, technically, the OP was reachable on various web pages, most notably their blog and Twitter. They certainly had an online presence even to this day, though whether they were willing to discuss this mystery years later was completely unknown. By 
By the beginning of 2022, search efforts overseas or outside of Japan were set in motion. Though, the ball truly began rolling on February 27th of 2022 with the launch of the Akiba Tape Discord server. While the subreddit does do well to document the search, a great deal of updates and discussion came about with the centralized hub on Discord. And it was around this time where contact with the original poster and owner of the tape was attempted. Despite the various attempts to reach out at this time, no contact was made with OP. Despite this, other objectives and tasks did come about, including While many can assume what the song was made for, the exact purpose of the track remained very much unknown. There's actually more theories for the song and the cassette tape's purpose than you'd think. Among the most common theories discussed were... One popular theory from the very start of the search was the song's possible creation to be used in an anime. One possible outcome is that the anime never was completed or that the anime itself is so obscure that it became lost media. Now, there wasn't anything substantial in validating this theory, though the lyrics of the song, as well as its overall feel, does seem to fit the theme of fiction. The song does sound very much like an ending theme to an obscure OVA to me personally, and there were many of those produced around this time, I, I assure you. Some validation for this theory lies within another song said to be on the cassette tape from the OP. Supposedly, the Akiba tape also included a song by the artist Yumiko Takahashi. This was stated by OP pretty early on. So, Takahashi's first single was released in 1990 and it was an anime opening. This anime was produced by NTV a TV channel that aired anime produced by the company Sunrise during this period. And thus, for this reason, it is theorized that the song may have been produced for a lost or unreleased NTV show or Sunrise anime. This is due to the inclusion of Takahashi on the tape and what Takahashi was affiliated with at this point in time. I mean, like I said, I personally feel like this sounds like an anime ending or even possibly an opening. I would honestly love to hear what you guys think in the comments though, so you know, let me know if you have any thoughts on that. Now, this theory actually comes from a noteworthy comment that took note of the use of instruments used as well as their use of them within the track. This was a theory that wasn't really discussed or speculated until this point. But allow me to provide you with the actual comment and the words of the commenter themselves. Just had a conversation with our Japanese musician in our company. He listened to the song, and he said that this is a possible demo song from Sony or Itachi, not sure which of the two, for sound demo for their music component products. However, he didn't know the said artist's name, nor when it was created or co-created by some production company. Hopefully we can find the origin of this song. This comment, in all honesty, may now hold a lot of weight. Originating from a restoration upload courtesy of iamps85, it's rather detailed. Really, it came out of nowhere, but it's not the typical comment that claimed to definitively know the source of the track. It is a theory that has not been explored too much, especially since the commenter did not elaborate further beyond that one singular comment, even after replies were made. However, with high-end stereo systems being in high demand and quite competitive in their marketing back then, this may be a viable outcome. I mean, I personally recall these types of demo discs being included with Bose music systems back in the mid-2000s. They were definitely a thing, albeit rather niche. Not really something you keep around and listen to for funsies, you know? And even if they were distributed, they were likely in the possession of the company that sold these stereo systems. They wouldn't really go home to the public, at least I don't think they would. So, in short, the likelihood of one of these audio sample showcase discs or cassettes being preserved is rather unlikely.
And lastly, the original theory of this being a song produced by a singer or band, being an idol that was brought on board to a talent agency, an artist or band that created a demo and attempt to be picked up by a label, or an early recording or scrap track by an already established artist of the time. There have been various established and publicly known artists speculated to have been the vocalist on the track, and we will explore that shortly. So, more details were actually discovered upon inspection of the cassette images provided by the OP. While the physical, tangible cassette itself was typical of the era, it was the marked out portion in the corner of the cassette's label that drew a lot of attention. It clearly said something, something that the people who scribbled it out did not want the public to see when it was probably donated to that secondhand shop. That something it said, exactly, was unclear. Nonetheless, there were various theories on what it said and why it was marked out. Perhaps the logo was a talent agency or record label. Maybe, possibly, and hopefully, a band that could further narrow down the date of the song's creation in some way. Maybe even something that could lead us to the actual name of the band or artist who created the song. Naturally, various theories as to what this said were speculated upon and, you know, thrown around. Though, despite this, nothing was confirmed. Upon inspection of that grainy original image, the most visible word under all that black ink was associates. And it was highly speculated that the word before it said representative, so representative associates. But what was unable to be fully confirmed and decoded through the photo available to us was the rest of it. And to clarify a detail I mentioned in the first Akiba tape video, this photo of the cassette is not the Akiba tape. Regardless, according to OP, the tape did look identical to this and had that same logo marked over in black ink. There is no official photo of the original Akiba tape with the track on it that's available online, and that makes the search particularly tricky. At this point in the search, in early 2022, contact was still being attempted with the original poster and owner of the tape. Despite this, hopes were low in the likelihood of them ultimately providing a response. I mean, let's be honest here, after all these years, OP may have put this time in their life behind them. Perhaps barely even recollecting this mystery in the modern day. Contact on OP's blog was attempted, and that didn't really prove to be fruitful as there was never any response. But then came the discovery of OP's Twitter account. A Twitter account that they were very active on to this day. OP, known on Twitter as Tekibaka, would often post Ohayou gozaimasu or good morning on their account. The most worthwhile and opportune window to respond was through these good morning tweets. Attempt was also made on old tweets that directly mentioned the Akiba tape as well. None of these response tweets were responded to in turn by Tekibaka. Only ignored. Uh, oh, actually, were they ever really ignored to begin with? It was finally in March of 2022 that a sudden and unexpected series of tweets were posted by Tekibaka out of nowhere. Posts that directly address the Akiba tape. So, about the song on the Akihabara tape that became famous with the cool fans as a do not search trend. These are the actual tapes that I bought at the same time, also for 50 yen. The Aji Nomoto gift tape had been recorded over, so the original content is gone. But the Oyomi-san no Ota tape was left untouched. Let's begin to unpack a little bit here. What is Ajinomoto? The answer to that is actually fairly simple. They're a Japanese food company. A very well-known and long-established food company, as a matter of fact. 
one that had produced many commercials over the years. Now, the gift part is a bit trickier. When looking into the complete phrasing Ajinomoto Gifdo as it's written in Japanese, something does come up. Cooking oils. More specifically, gift boxes of cooking oils and other cooking products sometimes. Perhaps a song on this specific tape was meant to be used in a commercial for this product. Maybe all the songs on this tape were meant to be reviewed and selected for a future commercial. Possibly compiled by that company with the scribbled out logo in the corner of the cassette tape. A second tweet in this thread followed shortly after. Part 2 of the actual tapes I bought in Akihabara. The cases and tapes have been left exactly as they were when I bought them, so they're kind of dirty. But when you look really closely, you can see Fujimoto Yuri written under the marker. And on the third picture, you can just about see demo tape written at the end of the line of marker. I think it's a pretty safe bet to say that these were tapes disposed of by some kind of organization. This one is pretty self-explanatory. Now, as far as who Fujimoto Yuri is, well, your guess is as good as mine. Many people come up upon searching this name with that specific kanji used in the tweet, and those who do come up are very unlikely to be associated with this tape. The most prominent person within the results being a 43-year-old politician whose name uses that same kanji that was specified again in the tweet. And this tape also literally says demo tape on it. While this does not narrow down information on the Akiba tape itself, this tape did come from that same shop and possibly the same company or organization. One of the reasons I deleted the first Akiba cassette tape video and renamed it I'm Glad We Found Out the Title is that I thought it might get into legal troubles concerning the song's copyright. Even though the song was completely unknown, no one knew the title, writer, or composer, I started to get worried about the fact that I had reposted it without permission. So since I uploaded that song to try to find out the writer, composer, or singer, I decided to re-upload it. The first time, I also uploaded it with mono audio. So I re-uploaded it with the original stereo audio, the same file that I personally own. However, as you all know, everything about the song is still unknown. There's an article about it on the Nico Nico Encyclopedia, but none of the creators of the song have ever commented on it or anything. Who knows whether any new information about this song will ever arise. This tweet is interesting as it shows that OP had fears of facing legal issues by having that original Nico Nico upload of the full song up like that. This truly isn't too outlandish of a concern. As far as copyright goes, Japan is exceptionally strict. And with this third tweet, it was confirmed that the original poster had not known any new information on the song. That it was just as much a mystery as the day they made that first post on Tuchan. It was following this post that an actual correspondence occurred as well. Kai, a very talented translator and honestly invaluable member of the Akiba Tape Discord, responded to this thread of tweets in Japanese. Asking what became of that original Akiba Tape with the mysterious song on it, Tekibaka did answer this tweet and the answer was not great. See, it turns out that the original poster, Tekibaka, had thrown out the original Akiba Tape. Of course, this news was absolutely less than ideal, though Tekibaka would continue to communicate with those involved in the search following this tweet, and that itself was a plus. As a matter of fact, shortly after, clearer photos of the logos scribbled out on the blue tapes were posted, giving us a much clearer look at that logo we discussed earlier. With these images, we could clearly see what it said for the most part. Tekibaka even wrote out the spelling in a tweet. 
What the Ajinomoto gift tape said, the one said to look exactly like the original Akiba tape was... Ada, Audio Representative Associates. However, this was not the only variation of the Ada logo. Clearer photos of the other tape were also eventually posted, and that showed that this one said Ada Company Limited. Both using that same Ada logo with the same font. So, Audio Representative Associates and Ada Company Limited. This information was a substantial lead in the search, but what was Ada? A talent agency? Recording studio? Something completely different? This Ada revelation would not be the only discovery found upon the second tape, however. Later on, the OP would post yet another tweet, this one with one of the Ada cassette tapes playing. One video in particular featured another unusual song, one that would turn out to be yet another Japanese mystery song. That's right, folks, now we have two. The only identifier being the writing on the cassette tape, not the one scribbled out with that auto logo, but one written as the title. Writing that read, Wagamama, which roughly translates to selfish or self-centered in Japanese. So, two Japanese mystery songs now, you guys. Both likely coming from the same Ada company, or at least the company that Ada represented? Despite ending up with more mystery on our hands, we did actually uncover a bit of information that may be helpful in the future. Now, on to the next discovery. Now, what if I told you that there may be a second tape with the Mysterious Song also on it? That being the original Mysterious Song, Fly Away. Or that that original tape came into the possession of another curious internet user somehow. This speculation comes from this Yahoo Answers post from August of 2021. And do keep in mind that this was well before I uploaded my original Akiba tape video, also in 2021, but a couple months later. This post claimed they obtained a blank cassette that was recorded onto from a hard-off, that being a Japanese secondhand store chain. They then go on to write the lyrics of the song, these lyrics being the lyrics of the mysterious song slash fly away. At the bottom of the post, they also listed off other songs supposedly on the tape, all idol songs from between 1981 and 1986. Now, unfortunately, all users on Japan's version of Yahoo Answers are anonymous and unable to be contacted. With that said, it's very unlikely that anything further will come from this discovery unless this poster comes forward on their own once again hopefully showing the tape itself and playing what's on it. Though, in all honesty, and many of you may be already thinking this, it may just be a LARP and nothing more. After all, OP had said that they discarded the tape, not that they sold it or gave it away to anyone. Now, before we get ahead of ourselves, let's get back to the original mystery song. Very early on in the search, artists' ideas were thrown around and speculated upon. That's a natural course of events that would come about in this type of search. With popularity of this mystery song growing, the artist theories have as well. Here are some commonly speculated artists as of right now.
This is the artist said to also be featured on the original Akiba tape along with the mystery song. The artist, who debuted in 1990 with that anime opening. While it's unlikely to actually be her, I am putting this theory out there nonetheless. So, here's some info on Takahashi. Her idol debut was in 1988, her single was released in 1990. The talent agencies she's been affiliated with in the past are Big Apple, Hirata Office, Toho Entertainment, and Koni. She has been with the record label Victor Entertainment since the very beginning. This has actually led to speculation that the mystery song may be owned by Victor Entertainment. Takahashi was most active in the early 1990s and her last official single was in 1999. A few best of albums have been released in the time since then, however. Not to be confused with Yumiko Takahashi, Reiko Takahashi became a candidate and possible vocalist of Fly Away in March of 2022. The primary reason for this is that she sounds similar and was active during the period the tape was likely recorded. Neko Takahashi also had a very short-lived career as an idol, only releasing four songs and is very obscure and unknown as far as idols go. There's more though. Neko Takahashi had also been signed to Victor, the same label Yumiko Takahashi was signed to. And it gets even better, folks. One of Takahashi's four songs in particular, a track titled Dabu Songu wa Utainai, aka I Can't Sing a Love Song, is rather similar in theme and lyrics to Fly Away. So maybe, just maybe, Fly Away was an early version of this song or scrapped due to it being too similar to I Can't Sing a Love Song. Another contender surfaced following an interesting Reddit post that detailed someone's own theory regarding the search. They explored commercials that had aired in the past for Ajinomoto Gift and ultimately stumbled upon another short-lived idol by the name of Yoko Tanaka. The entire post itself, despite the fact that none of it is confirmed, is an interesting read. I recommend going through the whole thing if you're able. It's pretty long. Active around the same time as the aforementioned idols, Tanaka was heavily involved in an anime that aired from 1990 to 1991 titled Idol Angel Yokoso Yoko. The anime was supposed to have 52 episodes in total, however, only 43 officially aired. The other nine are lost media. But why did this happen? Tanaka had made the decision to retire as an idol while the anime was still in production. According to an article linked in that original Reddit post, she was simply unhappy with how she was being managed. Piggybacking off that idol theory previously mentioned and taking note of the window of Tanaka's career, it's possible that Fly Away could have been made for idol angel Yokoso Yoko, possibly as an ending theme or something. Though, because this theory comes from a Reddit post that doesn't hold much weight in terms of factual evidence, take this one with a grain of salt. This one might be the oldest and longest lasting theory for the track. There's multiple reasons for this, with the biggest one holding a great deal of weight. First off, Adi Project or Adi Pro has been active since 1984. The group is quite famous in Japan today, contributing to a few well-known anime openings, though they were very underground and obscure in the 1980s. Adi Pro was not signed to a major label until the 1990s, and it's worth noting that they were also signed by Victor Entertainment, eventually, though this was not until 1996. One other observation, one that's been stated since way back in the Mysteries 2chan and Nico Nico days, is that Flyaway's vocalist does sound a lot like Akira Takarano, the vocalist of Adi Project. Takarano has continued to evolve her vocal style over the years and their current stuff is very avant-garde, but the early works of the group kind of fit the bill when looking into the tone and lyrics of Flyaway. The song itself also resembles the early Adi Pro music and the vocalist reflects Takarano's unique vocal style. It is possible that this song was an early Adi Pro demo or a tentative solo project of Takarano herself. Early Adi Project demo cassettes have been spotted online, so the idea isn't too far-fetched. 
Unfortunately, with Pro being the famous and successful duo it is today, contacting them is anything but an easy feat. It seemed as though speculation was merely speculation and that was it. But now, now is where the real action comes into play here. On November 11th of 2022, Discord users Kai and Austin and Oprotervum had actually gone through extensive effort in comparing the flyaway vocalist to the voice of Takara no herself. This is found in a YouTube video that I'll link in the description. Here's a bit of that comparison. And while this is far from definitive proof that Takarano was the vocalist, it may have set us on the right track and where attention should be set in terms of artist theories. In addition, in September of 2022, an early work by Takarano made for an anime was discovered online. In this track, she sings in a different style, one very similar to that of Fly Away. While I can't play the song here, links will be in the description to hear that for yourself. Please feel free to give it a listen and let me know your thoughts. With all of that said, at this point, at this current phase in the search, our biggest lead and hope for a possible artist appears to be Akira Takarano. Between the AI and that early anime track, it seems an artist suggested from the very start still remains a prominent adversary in our quest to get this song identified. And I really hope this isn't something I have to say for it to be understood, but I'll say it anyways. Please do not contact or hound any of these people I have named in this video. Please just be respectful, be kind. If you would like to follow the search efforts more closely, I implore those interested to join the Discord and work with the team already going about this in a respectful and polite manner. Anyways. What's also great is that we have that Ada logo to work with now. While the company remains especially elusive and is likely defunct at this point, finding any information on this company would prove invaluable. After hearing that second mystery song, interest in that one, as well as the cassette tape that it was on, had blossomed. Especially because this tape was said to not have been recorded over and also had that Ada logo. Inspecting this tape further could prove to be beneficial. With the cooperation of Tekibaka, user iamps85 contacted Tekibaka in hopes they could somehow purchase the tape from them, or at least obtain it to preserve it digitally. And, well, it worked. After a few weeks, the tape was in the possession of iamps85 and more discoveries were made. This includes showcasing the song in full, more clear photos of the tape, and iamps85 being able to remove much of the black ink, revealing the very first clear and unobscured look at the Ada logo. And lastly, I wanted to mention this interesting little idea I found recently on r slash Japan's mystery song. Reddit user Robometal had apparently taken note of a Japanese YouTube comment saying they wished this mystery would be submitted to a Japanese show titled Night Scoop so that it could be further researched. Night Scoop is a show that's been airing on Asahi Broadcasting since 1988 that takes on viewer-submitted mysteries. I mean, if the show happened to take note of the Akiba tape mystery, possibly using necessary resources available to a large Japanese channel to get to the bottom of it, well, wouldn't that be something?